Greetings students of the force, welcome back to the channel. As you can see by the video's length, we are a huge fan of Darth Sidious Emperor Palpatine here. This three hours worth of content only really represents about a third of all of the content that we've made about Darth Sidious, and also content about the Sith Master that we hope to produce in the future. For now though, if you're as interested in the greatest Sith Lord to ever live as we are, we hope you enjoy this lore video compilation. Thank you as always my friends for all of the support on the channel, may the force be with you, and I hope you enjoy. Emperor Sheev Palpatine's insatiable lust for power has led him into decades of conquest and ruthless bloodshed, subjugating nearly the entire galaxy within his grasp. Over the years, he has come up against some of the most powerful opponents that the galaxy has to offer, only to best nearly every one of them in single combat. While his duels with Master Yoda and Mace Windu are the most iconic and well-remembered encounters, one particular duel leaves us with a few questions. During the Clone Wars, Sidious battled his own former apprentice turned cornerstone of the criminal underworld, Darth Maul, who sought to confront Palpatine with his brother, Savage Opress, by his side. Though they were ultimately defeated by Palpatine during this battle, Maul wielded the Darksaber, the iconic Mandalorian artifact which grants control of the entire Mandalorian armada to the wielder, denoting them as the ruler of Mandalore. By all accounts, Palpatine should have inherited the Darksaber from Maul after defeating him in solo combat in accordance with the Mandalorian custom, and he would have been able to command the Mandalorians as well as both the Grand Army of the Republic as well as the Separatist fleet. So then, why didn't Palpatine Palpatine claimed the Darksaber for himself after defeating Maul. Why did he let Maul keep control of Mandalore, and what would have happened if Palpatine decided to claim the Darksaber for himself? Well today, students of the Force, let's answer why Palpatine let Mandalore slip through his fingertips and did not claim the Darksaber. It's first important to understand Palpatine's master plan and why it worked in the first place. While control of Mandalore would have been incredibly sought after by most power-hungry tyrants, Palpatine had much bigger plans at work, and controlling Mandalore would have actually been a detriment more so than it would have been a benefit to his ultimate endgame. On the surface, control over all three of these positions seems to be the ultimate ultimate power play. But the reason Palpatine was ultimately able to obtain control of the galaxy was because he got the Republic and the Separatists to destroy one another. Having control over both sides meant nothing if he was exposed as a double agent, and he could only gain full power by eradicating both sides at once, meaning that Darth Sidious would have had to publicly claim control of the Darksaber and the Mandalorian throne in order for the Mandalorians to follow him in the first place. And this would have ended the entire strategy with which he had been working on for so long, and the strategy established by Darth Bane a thousand years ago. If he outs himself as Darth Sidious and rules as an open Sith Lord, then the Jedi would finally be able to find the ever-elusive Sith Master that had been plaguing their ranks for years, and he would have had a target on his back the size of the Death Star. If Chancellor Palpatine assumed the role, however, and never exposed his dual identity as a Sith Lord, then it would have had a completely different set of ramifications. First, he would have to explain exactly why and how he is talented enough to best a Sith apprentice in physical combat, which he might not have had an answer to. This would also be a direct conflict of interest, as he only commands the Republic as the Supreme Chancellor, but the Jedi Order as well, and his dual leadership over both factions would have likely been disastrous. Palpatine's goal was not to control just one planet or one faction of individuals, but it was to reign supreme over the entire galaxy. But in order to do this, however, he had to let some benefits slip away in favor of a larger grand scheme. Palpatine could have theoretically controlled Mandalore, but this is where his plan would have Ended. Allowing himself to stay in the shadows was much more valuable than controlling all of the Mandalorian people. If he assumed the title of Mandalore as Darth Sidious, then he could have waged a full-on war against the Jedi with a Sith Lord commanding the Mandalorian army, which likely would have been a difficult task for the Jedi to subvert. Not to mention, he couldn't have executed Order 66 anymore, because Order 66 required an immense amount of preparation. The reason that Order 66 worked wasn't because it simply eradicated the Jedi, but it worked because because he was able to frame the Jedi for treason after being confronted by Mace Windu, and therefore he had cause. If he decided to blindly execute the Order without any justification, then the Senate would have never allowed him to create a new empire without just cause. And if he was ruling over Mandalore at the same time, then this very public conflict of interest would have crippled Sidious's plan. There is simply no way for him to utilize the Order because everyone would know exactly why he executed the Jedi. As history has shown, however, 
however, conflicts between the Jedi and the Mandalorians seldom end well. And now that the Jedi also had an army of clones at their side, then it would make much more sense to Palpatine to continue with his initial plan. This initial strategy allowed Sidious to create an entirely new style of government far larger than anything the Mandalorians could have provided him. And while the Mandalorians would have been valuable assets, his plan far outweighed simply controlling Mandalore. Palpatine never needed an army, nor did he ever have to be in the front lines of a war in order to win one. He was always a strategist and a master manipulator. This is why it was so rare, in fact, for Darth Sidious to personally go confront Maul on Mandalore. In fact, Sidious already had two armies at his disposal, yet he never served as the leading general of either. He never had to, as Darth Bane proclaimed that the Sith would rule from the shadows and would no longer be outright warriors, but would now become some of the most influential members of the entire galaxy from the shadows, and the Sith had not been able to win a war as purebred warriors. Now they would finally win the war though as scientists, bankers, and politicians. While the Darksaber served its own series of advantages that Palpatine could have used, especially after the rise of the Empire, the consequences of wielding the Darksaber publicly would have far outweighed any benefits he could have collected by assuming control of the Mandalorian creed. Palpatine had his grand plan in place, and taking control of the Mandalorians was never a part of it. He did not venture to the world of Mandalore to claim the Darksaber in single combat against Darth Maul, although after defeating him, it absolutely would have been his right to claim all of Mandalore. Instead, it was his goal to completely destroy the galaxy and remake it in his own image with the Empire, and destroy the two prominent governing forces in the Republic and the Separatists. And taking the Darksaber for his own would have outed him as a Sith Lord, or would have raised numerous important questions, not to mention at the time Darth Sidious did not need the Mandalorians to get rid of the Jedi, as he already had the clones. But anyway, my friends, what are your thoughts on this, and what are your thoughts on our analysis and answer? Do you believe that this makes sense as to why exactly Darth Sidious decided not to claim the Darksaber after defeating Maul in single combat? Do you believe that this was the right move, or do you think that he could have potentially kept it secret and ruled over Mandalore as a Sith Lord? As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching the channel. Hit that subscribe button, and may the Force be with you. Hello guys and welcome back to the Stupendous Wave. Lightsabers have been an integral part of the Star Wars universe as the select weapon of choice used by the force wielding factions of the Jedi and the Sith. So fan expectations were high to see if Emperor Palpatine ever used one. We saw his devastating display of skill in Revenge of the Sith as well as in the Clone Wars as Palpatine dispatched four Jedi Masters, faced off against Grandmaster Yoda, and dealt with Maul and Savage Opress with considerable ease. But just like every other Saber user, his was specifically designed to meet Palpatine's own needs and his needs alone. Due to this, his lightsaber had a very unique design that was not only hated by every Jedi, but would come to be despised by even Darth Vader himself. But why? As we know, lightsabers are a specific reflection of someone's own inner workings and their own self-design. Therefore, it would make sense why the lightsaber would reflect them. So what made the Jedi despise his lightsaber so much? And what were Palpatine's lightsabers made of specifically meant to insult the Jedi's core philosophies? Well today, we will answer that question. First though, according to our analytics, a lot of you that watch the channel haven't actually subscribed yet. So if you've been enjoying the Star Wars content and would like to keep up to date on everything Star Wars related daily, force crush that subscribe button. Now acolytes, let us begin. Sidious's lightsabers were made of a rare and extremely expensive metal. Several metals, in fact. They were made of Frick, which was a largely indestructible metal only really found on Gormus or Tatooine. It also sported an erodium emitter, erodium being a yellow-colored metal rarer and more precious than gold and it sported a shiny Electrum finish. Electrum, perhaps the most important of the metals aforementioned. As everyone is aware, a lightsaber is also known as a Jedi's weapon. Palpatine specifically crafted this lightsaber to insult them because of one of the Jedi's core philosophies. This philosophy to remain humble and to know their place as a servant of the Force and the galaxy at large. Sidious's lightsaber, though, would not represent any of these qualities. Quite the opposite, in fact, by design. By constructing his lightsaber of the most expensive material, Sidious spat in the face of that ideology. His lightsabers were a statement which basically said that he rejected humility and that the galaxy and the Force will be servants only to him. Ever the pragmatist, Sidious already had prepared a backup lightsaber, 
This weapon was initially identical to his first lightsaber with the Electrum and Frick finish, again identical to the lightsaber that he originally constructed. However, Sidious would later make the decision to retrofit it with an unknown black alloy. Darth Sidious created his lightsaber during his apprenticeship and used this weapon throughout his Sith training under Darth Plagueis. When he began his political career, he concealed his lightsaber within a statue in his Senate chambers. The weapon remained hidden within the statue for at least two decades, waiting until Palpatine needed it. Continuing on now with the make of the lightsaber and the greater details of it, the weapon sported shorter handles, which perfectly suited Palpatine's more one-handed fighting style. Sidious was a master of all seven forms of lightsaber combat, but often preferred to use Form 7, Juyo. However, he was also known to fall back into Form 6, Nyman. Sidious's form was a sort of mix, implementing the acrobatics of Ataru and the aggression of Dejem So. The fourth and fifth forms of lightsaber combat Combat, respectively. Juyo heavily emphasized using the mindset of the dark side in order to use it properly. One had to completely succumb to the lure of the dark side and use their own ambition, their inner emotion and hatred with every strike and motion. This was something that came quite easily to Sidious. Sidious's form was one that was completely banned in the Jedi Order, until of course Mace Windu came up with the Vapad variant. This design choice is where Vader had issues with the lightsabers though, stating that they were inferior to the lightsabers that he would go on to construct. In the dawning days of the Galactic Empire following Order 66 and during the Great Jedi Purge, Vader was a fledging Sith Lord, having just barely gotten a hold of being within his new suit. His bloodthirst for Jedi was insatiable and he scoured every corner of the galaxy, turning over every rock to find every Jedi going this way and that, finding all of the ancient order. Since having lost his lightsaber on Mustafar, Sidious lent Vader one of his own lightsabers to use, until the Sith Lord would eventually construct one of his own design. What a joke that was. If Vader's torment in his suit wasn't enough, the lightsaber was the final straw. Due to its construction, it was difficult to wield for Vader's larger gloved hands. The unfamiliar style it required clashed heavily with Vader's preferred style, and soon he found Sidious's lightsaber an absolute chore to use. Sidious hardly ever used his lightsaber, as he was under the belief that the Sith had grown beyond their use and he simply owned one to mock the Jedi. Whether or not this is true, the fact still remains that Sidious was incredibly powerful in the Force, and proved it by never really using his sabers unless absolutely necessary. We can see in the fight between him, Maul, and Savage that he seems to just be toying with the two of them cackling and smiling as he moves around them and between them with ease. Due to this, Vader would come to believe that his lightsabers weren't meant for heavy dueling, but were rather more decorative if anything. He commented that it was less of a weapon and more like a piece of jewelry. Ultimately, Vader would be correct in his assessment, as Sidious did regard his weapon as little more than effects to his style rather than a necessary tool. Sidious often judged the Sith by their power within the Force, and not their skill with the lightsaber, as he believed true power could only lie within the dark side and one's command over it. Soon enough, Vader would construct his own lightsaber, which was far more simplistic in design and a much larger one to fit Vader's hands and his two-handed fighting style, ultimately swearing off the use of Sidious's lightsaber ever again. So friends, what do you think of how everyone reacted to Sidious's widely hated lightsabers for very different reasons? What do you think of Sidious's lightsabers? Let us know down below. As always, we would love to hear your thoughts on the subject, and again, May the Force be with you, and we hope that you are having a great day. Darth Sidious was truly the most feared man at the time of the Clone Wars, as well as the most brilliant tactician in all of Star Wars history. As the Dark Lord of the Sith, he effortlessly controlled the galaxy like a marionette on strings, playing both sides of the war like a chess match with himself and played the so-called Guardians of Peace and Justice, the Jedi, for complete fools. Able to mask his presence while sitting in the very same room as Grandmaster Yoda, one of the most powerful beings in the Force at the time. He had maintained complete control over the Senate as well as the Separatists, and had even turned the prophecy of the Chosen One against the very Jedi who created it. Sidious had achieved what no other Sith yet, no other being in the galaxy had ever done destroy the Republic single-handedly. 
Palpatine was truly a man or a being like no other. But like all things, big or small, this titan among men does have a history as well as a childhood. So what exactly did this entail? And why didn't the Jedi find Palpatine as a child despite being massively force sensitive? In The Phantom Menace, Qui-Gon mentions that if Anakin had been born on a world in the Republic, then they would have identified him directly through the Force much sooner. Palpatine's homeworld of Naboo was in fact a part of the Republic, so why hadn't he been identified by the Jedi considering his enormous midichlorian count? A count that even exceeded that of Yoda's. Well my friends, put on your best robe, because today we will be walking into the Senate chambers of the Supreme Chancellor himself, and looking into Darth Sidious's history before his Sithhood. We have done a few videos in the past about Palpatine's childhood, so for now, let's do a quick recap of his childhood. Chief Palpatine was born on the planet of Naboo to an aristocratic family that was one of the most influential of that day. Cassigna was the head of the Palpatine family and Sheev's father. A spineless and oily man, Cassigna was always more than ready to use his family's wealth and influence to throw credits at whatever problems would plague him, including problems created by his son. Unfortunately, it didn't seem as though he would be able to throw enough credits at his biggest problem in the end this again being his son. Sheev was always of the opinion that the Palpatines had plenty of room to grow and could amass far more power on Naboo, however that his father insisted that they had gone as high as they could go, and he just desired to live out the rest of his days in luxury and peace. Sheev would rebel against his father and the two butted heads throughout his many years. Just to slight him, Sheev would do a great many misdemeanors that would get any other youth into prison. However, not wanting to taint his family name, Cassigna always bought off the people that Sheev affected with his antics. This went as far as Sheev killing two pedestrians in a speeder accident and getting off scot-free again because of his father. Due to the lack of consequences and moral guidance, as well as always seeing how power and influence can keep you free, Sheev Palpatine never learned any sort of morality or adopted any conscience of his own. Sheev would eventually decide to slight his father even further by refusing to go by his given name and only be referred to by his aristocratic family name, Palpatine, which is why we don't ever hear anything or any mention of Palpatine's first name, his original given name, Sheev, in the original trilogy at all. With this briefly out of the way, it was important to understand what kind of man his cowardly father was in order to understand why the Jedi didn't find Palpatine when he was a young boy. In the Darth Plagueis novel though, lies our deeper answer to this question. It was insinuated that Palpatine's father and mother always had a sort of sense that he was different. And not only different, but also incredibly dangerous. From an early age, they gained fear for their son, and supposedly did their best to keep him of somewhat of a secret. All of Sheev's misdeeds were meticulously bought off, so no one raised a stink about their family. He was mostly tutored in private before going off to study in a school, which he was of course kicked out of. Due to the nature of this public secrecy, it is highly plausible that Cassigna could have paid for things to stay quiet, especially unwanted attention from the Jedi, which was the last kind of attention that Palpatine Patriarch wanted associated with his family image. By the time that Darth Plagueis himself, or as he referred to in the public, Higo Damask, met the young Palpatine, he was a bright young man in university who still carried much rage within his heart. Plagueis described how he had attempted to use the Force to delve into the boy's mind mind and prod around for some information on the curious lad. He would be left ultimately disappointed yet again though, however, intrigued by the fact that he could barely feel anything when sensing Palpatine, which he thought was miraculous. Plagueis had a very difficult time sensing the boy's presence in the Force even while he was trying to. This leads us to believe that Palpatine had an innate ability to cloak his Force signature without even knowing it, or perhaps it was even intentional. This is again another reason why the Jedi never sensed or found the boy on Naboo, not to mention while as he was a senator he was able to stand feet away from a Jedi, some of the most powerful Jedi of the era, and they could not sense his place in the force. It's important to note though that this is the legends explanation, and the canon explanation could be very different. But due to the lack of a canon answer, this is what we will have to base our assumptions on. If the Jedi had found Palpatine, it is likely that they would have thought he could have been the chosen one due to his exceptionally high midichlorian count. Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon were astounded to find that Anakin's count had exceeded that of Master Yoda's. 
Well, Palpatine's did as well. Master Yoda's midichlorian count sat at around 17,700, whereas Sidious's clocked in at around 20,000. Though I can't help but feel that even if Palpatine had been trained by the Jedi, that things would have turned out any differently. In the Book of the Sith, Sidious talks about how he had been intrigued by the Sith ever since he was a young boy. It was almost fated. How that on Naboo, he would use his family's wealth to acquire Sith knowledge on the black market. Growing up in the Jedi Temple, I would presume that Palpatine would still be just as rebellious and would eventually find the way into the forbidden section of the Jedi archives. This would include all sorts of Sith knowledge, artifacts, and even holocrons that were looted from the temples during the Great Wars of old. Palpatine would have likely taken every opportunity to study these manuscripts and becoming fascinated by the Sith likely would have snuck away from the Order to seek them out. Or another likely scenario being that Plagueis and him would still find one another. There were several occasions that Higo Damas came into contact with Masters Qui-Gon Jinn, Dooku, and sifo Dyas. With him being in close proximity to these Jedi, perhaps he would have come across Palpatine all the same, and sensed the growing dark side curiosity within the young Jedi initiate. Nonetheless, the answer to our question appears to be that the Palpatine family hid Sheev from the public eye, including the prying eye of the Jedi, and that Palpatine had an innate ability to block his own Force signature from other Force sensitives, as if he could block his signature from Darth Plagueis, one of the most inherently gifted dark side wielders of all time. He could surely block his presence from a common Jedi. Not to mention that it was essentially fated for Palpatine to become a Dark Lord. But in Darth Malgus, the Butcher, the False Emperor, the Dark Lord. Darth Malgus is one of the most fearsome and formidable Sith Lords that have ever existed, bred specifically with the idea to conquer and destroy the Jedi. The era in which Malgus was born was far different from the current Star Wars era that we now explore freely. Malgus was born in an era where the Sith Empire was powerful yet still in hiding fearful of the watching eyes of the Republic as well as the Jedi. Malgus was bred and born with the sole purpose to conquer. During this era of the Sith Empire, Sith Lords were bred for specific purposes, some to rule, some to be ruled, and some like Malgus as pure brutes of the dark side of the Force. But Malgus was so much more than that and grew to be one of the most formidable and terrifying Sith Lords that have ever lived, a name that would garner fear not only among the Jedi and the members of the Republic, but the Sith Order and Empire as well. Darth Malgus, whose given name was Verdun, was born on the Sith capital world of Droman Kaas. As a young child, Verdun was stripped away from his true parents and given to an adoptive stepfather, who was completely loyal to the cause of the reconstructed Sith Empire, and who would regularly enroll Malgus in classes to hone his Force-sensitive skills, his skill with the blade, as well as to be indoctrinated truly into the philosophy of the Sith. Malgus was born to kill, and kill he did destroying several of his stepfather's servants just because he wanted to prove to himself that he could. An act that you think would normally enrage his stepfather. Rather, his stepfather, as well as his Sith teachers, were very pleased by this gesture of pure aggression and inconsiderate of any life whatsoever, believing his life and the life of the Sith Empire was more valuable than the lesser creatures of the galaxy. These lesser creatures that purely existed to be dominated by the Sith. Verdun would eventually be selected by a Sith Master by the name of Darth Vindican, a Sith Master who he would later betray and kill because he deemed him too weak as he saw his master be defeated by a Jedi in single combat. Believing that only the strongest deserved to live, Malgus killed his injured master, unwilling to care for him. Malgus would go on to become one of the greatest war generals that the Sith Empire had ever seen, dominating the battlefield with his sheer force of will. It was during the conflict called the Great Galactic War where Malgus would truly earn his reputation. A reputation that centuries following his death would reach the ears of Sidious and Vader respectively. Two Sith Lords that would eventually dominate the galaxy completely and two Sith Lords that held a great respect for the ancient Malgus. Sidious believed that Malgus would have been the perfect apprentice, and even considered the fact that if Malgus had been around during Vader's defeat on Mustafar, Sidious may have actually discarded his current apprentice in Anakin in favor of Malgus. Vader, on the other hand, realized the great physical turmoil that Malgus had endured during his long lifetime and tenure as a false Sith Emperor, receiving multiple injuries and augmenting his body with cybernetics to the fullest of its current 
capabilities and technology at the time. It was because of this that Vader grew great inspiration from Malgus and his fighting style. Realizing that Malgus was an expert at Form 5 lightsaber combat, specifically its dueling-centric variant to Gem So, a form that Anakin had utilized during his time as a Jedi Knight. Malgus, though, was far more brutish than Anakin, relying on his emotions to fuel his hatred and power in the dark side itself. Sidious believed that Malgus was a Sith Lord far beyond his time, and would have essentially been the perfect depiction of Darth Maul. Darth Maul, a pure Sith assassin and brute, but he believed that Malgus would have been a Sith brought to its fullest extent, and the true potential of a Sith apprentice, no one that even Sidious would deem worthy of ruling the Sith Empire at any point in time, but rather a tool to be moved around. This is what Wikipedia states about Malgus. Darth Malgus had a distinct personality among the Sith. He was a frontline warrior who often utilized alien mercenaries to do his bidding, even when they were considered to be unreliable by the Sith in his time. Because of his interactions with many alien species, Malgus learned many alien languages. Malgus's personality justified his reputation as a fierce frontline warrior. He believed that he was born to fight, and the Sith Empire was the instrument through which he realized his purpose. To him, the cost of war did not matter regardless of how high it could be. Malgus perceived the Force as a source of conflict. Malgus believed that Jedi could grow powerful, but ultimately that they were fools. Malgus did not tolerate failure at any cost. After he killed Jedi Master Chaos and Durach and learned of Satil Shan and her comrades' escape, he felt disgusted with his Sith Master, Darth Vindican, for not assuring a total victory of the Sith. Although he struck the wounded, pure-blooded Sith Lord down, he nonetheless savored their last victory together against the Jedi. Darth Malgus was an exceptionally talented duelist and specialized in using rage and brute strength to defeat his opponents. Aside from his overwhelming physical strength, which served him well not only in lightsaber duels but also in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Malgus was also capable of performing acrobatic feats to increase his effectiveness in lightsaber combat. His speed was such that normal humans found it difficult to watch his movement within duels. A ferocious Sith warrior with a terrifying reputation, Darth Malgus relished in raging in combat on the front line. He was personally responsible for the deaths of several highly skilled Jedi Masters. During the retaking of Korriban, he implored Jarkai dual blade fencing to kill Jedi Battlemaster Sin Durach. Despite the latter's proficiency in the same fighting style and victory over Malgus's master, Darth Vindican. Darth Malgus' rage and clear focus gave him an advantage and allowed him to swiftly deprive Kaosen of one of his lightsabers, ultimately killing the renowned Jedi Battlemaster. Darth Malgus was also a talented hand at Force Lightning and was even the pioneer of several deadly Force abilities within the Dark Side itself, being the creator of the ability known as Force Maelstorm. Force Maelstorm was a devastating combination of powers of a protection bubble, telekinesis, as well as Force Lightning. First, the user would use a Force bubble around their body, concealing and protecting them inside. Then, any loose objects slash persons around the user would swirl around the bubble through the use of telekinesis. And finally, the user would devastate the objects by blasting them away with a shockwave of energy accompanied by a surge of force lightning. Force Maelstorm is one of the most deadly force abilities in the known Star Wars mythos, with Malgus being its original creator. Malgus was also a talented hand at both force grip as well as force crush, and was considered considered one of the best hands at telekinesis in the entire Sith Empire. Malgus could even hide his very presence within the Force. Interestingly enough, a Jedi on Alderaan used this ability to suppress his Force signature when he planned to ambush Malgus, but this was not effective against Malgus, and Malgus still managed to sense his presence and foil his plans. Hundreds of years after Malgus' death, Darth Sidious would obtain a journal directly written by Malgus himself. Sidious ultimately determined that Malgus was a pioneer of the Dark Arts as well as the Way of the Sith and believing that he should show this example to Darth Vader as a true brooding Sith Lord. A Sith Lord who dominated nearly every single one of his enemies, was loyal not to the Order of the Sith, but to the dark side of the Force itself, and was a purebred fighter, a true warrior of the darkness. Darth Malgus is without a shadow of a doubt the greatest Sith warrior that has ever existed within Star Wars, a purebred Sith warrior, someone who defines the very definition of a warrior among the ancient Sith Empire. Malgus lived to kill and to dominate, and the Sith Empire was simply the instrument in which he enacted this purpose. But anyway my friends, what are your thoughts on this?
The Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Sidious, was the culmination of the Sith Rule of Two. By implementing the Rule of Two, established by Darth Bane centuries prior, he managed to almost single-handedly corrupt the entire galaxy. Once again, all of the inhabitants of the galaxy bowed to the Rule of the Sith. He fulfilled their ultimate goal. Palpatine was the ultimate Sith Lord. But for 20 years after his triumph, Palpatine had to do something to fill his time. And the Sith Lord became bored. For fulfilling his ultimate goal and his sole purpose, and afterwards felt as though, if even a little, his goal and the goals of the entire Sith Order were complete, and it was now only his job to maintain. But this does not mean that the Dark Lord did not have his fun. In the years following the establishment of the Empire and Palpatine proclaiming himself Emperor, the Sith Lord became more and more of a recluse, focusing almost entirely on the Sith Doctrine rather than governing the Empire that he had established. Instead, he left this task to the Imperial Council, which he ruled over with an iron fist. Vader and Tarkin handled the day-to-day -day functions of the Empire, while Sidious studied Sith lore in secret. In the canon novel Lords of the Sith, Sidious comments about the mundane life of leading the Empire, and achieving the ultimate goal of the Sith, and conquering the entire galaxy for their own. He mentions what his master Darth Plagueis would think about walking the halls of a Star Destroyer, and how the lack of stimulation for Palpatine maddened him. Still though, he had achieved his ultimate goal. Besides just studying Sith lore, Palpatine filled his time with torturing what few Jedi managed to survive Order 66, but he would not torture them personally. Palpatine demanded that a select few Jedi who had been beaten and starved be brought to his chamber, where he would then have them fight to the death for his own entertainment. His ultimate goal here was to see one of the Jedi turn to the dark side of the Force and offer them a chance at life offer them a chance to serve as one of his inquisitors and hunt down his fellow Jedi. Unfortunately for the Jedi though, Palpatine would snatch this promise away every single time. Once witnessing the Jedi turning to the dark side of the force, Palpatine would kill them, taking away their one final hope. Palpatine knew he was dominant over all of the Jedi. He just wanted to remind himself. For the first several decades of the Empire, Palpatine had little opposition. His master plan had come together so perfectly, almost too perfectly, that he found himself consistently bored. Not to mention, he feared within himself that he could not hand over the Empire to a worthy successor. Being exceptionally disappointed in Anakin Skywalker's loss to his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi on Mustafar. A loss that scarred his would-be successor in Darth Vader, both physically as well as mentally. This is why, when Luke Skywalker appears in the galaxy and is confirmed as Anakin Skywalker's son, Palpatine too has a glimpse of hope. A glimpse of hope that maybe he will not have to prolong his life eternally, but instead could hold the reins of the Empire over to a worthy and a powerful successor in Luke. As mentioned, Palpatine's rule as Emperor was maddening. He fulfilled his ultimate goal and ruled over the entire galaxy, something all Sith before him clamored for. But once he had fulfilled his purpose, once he had completed his sole mission, Palpatine was maddened by the idea that this was his peak. And so he delved deep into Sith lore and tortured what few Jedi remain. Anyway, my friends, what are your thoughts on this? And there is no emotion, there is peace. There is no ignorance, there is knowledge. There is no passion, there is serenity. There is no chaos, there is harmony. There is no death there is the Force. The Jedi Code was a set of rules that governed the behavior of the Jedi Order. It taught its followers not to give in to feelings of anger towards other life forms, which would help them resist fear and prevent them from falling to the dark side of the Force. The Sith were strongly opposed to the Jedi Code in its philosophy, believing that there was no such thing as peace and believing that emotion was the true pathway to power. Surprisingly though, there was however one line in the Jedi Code that the Sith believed in. The Sith such as Palpatine and his master Darth Plagueis specifically. One line that they abided by, and one line that drove Darth Plagueis insane. The Sith were strongly opposed to every single line of the code save the last. There is no death, there is the Force. Essentially what this meant for a Jedi was this. The Jedi believed that when one physically died, their presence and very essence joined with the Force itself meaning that there was no real literal death for a Jedi, that only they bound with the Force for eternity. 
Darth Plagueis and Palpatine, though, interpreted this in a different way. They believed that the Force could actually free them from death. Darth Plagueis was a powerful and influential member of the galaxy for several decades. However, he became fascinated with the idea of cheating death itself, therefore taking the last line of the Jedi Code extremely seriously, the fact that perhaps the Force could free him from death itself, something that Plagueis ultimately achieved with several life forms, however not himself. In a way though, the Sith took and altered what the Jedi Code believed in, interpreting the last line very differently. But it is intriguing that nonetheless, on a few separate occasions, Palpatine did actually admit to agreeing with this last line of the Jedi Code. In staunch contrast to this though, this is what the Sith Code had to say. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. Plagueis believed that the Force itself would in fact free him. In many respects, the Sith Code was a very inversion of the Jedi Code, with its main goal being to destroy the weak and to be strong, while the Jedi Code believed that there was peace and balance in all things. Therefore, that's why it's significant that this very last line is something that Plagueis and Palpatine would ultimately agree with. Plagueis would experiment with the death and force for several decades, again ultimately falling victim to the rule of two, when his own apprentice and Lord Sidious would betray and murder him. Sidious though, always believed strongly in this last line of the Jedi Code even if the Jedi themselves did not interpret it this way. Anyway my friends, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on the fact that Plagueis and Palpatine did actually agree with this single line of the Jedi Code, even though it was a perversion? According to my analytics, a lot of you guys that watch the channel haven't actually subscribed yet, so if you've been enjoying the content, force choke that subscribe button and turn on notification. As always my friends, may the force be with you and have a great day. Hey guys and welcome back to the channel. Today we have a topic that is rather obscure but still all the more interesting. In Revenge of the Sith and Attack of the Clones, we get to see the office of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine. Palpatine had modified and personalized his office in the council chambers because he didn't intend to be voted out anytime soon and was most certainly in it for the long haul. Within these chambers, he had adorned them with a few personal touches, such as several Brosnium statues depicting four distinct humanoids. While it is easy to write off these as just background decoration, anyone who knows Palpatine knows that he hardly ever does anything without a hitting meaning, plan, or purpose, including these statues, as they have an intricate backstory that reaches to the very beginning of the Star Wars timeline, and may have even been an inspiration for the Sith Order as we know it today. The best part about all of this is that it is indeed canon, so without further ado, it is time to tell the tale of the Four Sages. The Four Sages of Duarte were a group of politicians and philosophers that hailed from the planet of Duarte and had a large influence within the earliest days of the Galactic Republic's reign, formation, and constitution. The Four Sages, named Sistros, Brata, Feia, and Yan Jun were actually rather notorious and controversial figures in their day. Although the Four Sages were noted for possessing much arcane wisdom, their views and decrees were regarded as coldly unsparing and often generated controversy among others, especially to species new to the Republic. Sistros was accused of pandering to the multitude for selfish ends. Brata was known for having encouraged the study of the dark side of the Force. Keep in mind that they existed at the formation of the Galactic Republic, which places them around 25,000 years before the Battle of Yavin. One thing to consider is that the Jedi Order by now was still on the planet of Tython in its infancy and very much involved in their study, not looking to the wider galaxy for counsel or even a part of it at all. The Second Great Schism, which was the birth of the Sith Order, happened in the year 7003 BBY. To give you guys a little bit more perspective, it is believed by some that the Four Sages' practices and encouragement of exploring the dark side, it was one of the inspirations behind the very Sith Order itself, which is the exact reason why they were placed within Palpatine's office. This theory can be backed up by the very fact that Palpatine seems to admire them a great deal, having not only those larger statues in his office, but a collection of miniaturized Bronzium statues that he kept with him. 
In the ceremonial office area, two statues stood on either side of the Chancellor's official desk. In fact, Palpatine seemed to have a specific affinity for Sistros. Sistros was the largest statue in his office, and where he kept his second lightsaber hidden. He took a small statue of Sistros with him wherever he went to travel. Furthermore, his assistant and lead advisor, Masa Meta, had a small statue of Sistros on the top of his speaker staff. These statues would continue to be present into the formation of the Empire, in important symbols. Unfortunately, there is very little information regarding what the Four Sages did in their days, and what they actually stood for, besides their political Political influences. And again, unfortunately, there isn't any information on what powers they may have held within the Force. But if we know anything about the ancient Sith, it would be very easy to call the Four Sages the first Sith to ever exist, and with an openly encouraging the study of the Dark Side, they feared very little. Of course, back in the day, the Jedi Order had yet to become involved in the Galactic Republic, so the Dark Side didn't yet have such a taboo tied to it. The Bronze Neum statues themselves were actually forged by the Sith sometime during the reign in the galaxy, which means that the Sith Order does somewhat revere these four beings. Perhaps the Sages themselves may not be considered Sith, but it is clear that the Sith have some sort of connection and even reverence towards the Four Beings. So perhaps the Four Sages were somewhat representative of the Dark Side in its infancy and the beginnings of what one day would form into the Sith Empire. Stepping into speculation territory now, if I know anything about the Sith, then I know that they won't pass up an opportunity to imbue power within any item that they craft. Ancient Sith were known for making many powerful talismans and things to give themselves more power, as well as an edge against light side wielders, obviously the Jedi, that did not implore these practices. Here is our theory revolving around the Four Sages and their statues within Palpatine's office. We believe that each and every one of these many statues in Palpatine's office were each imbued with the dark side of the Force, which helped further cloud the vision of the Jedi, the Jedi that would have entered Palpatine's office, and to further obscure him from their senses. As powerful as Palpatine is with his ability to use Force Cloak technique, which is the ability and power for Sith to bury their darkness deep enough to elude the senses of a Jedi, it would still be difficult to believe that he escaped the vision of even Grandmaster Yoda, even as the Grandmaster sat a table length away. However, it makes a lot of sense that all of these statues were radiating some sort of dark energy that would cloud his sight while feeding Palpatine's energy. Masameta always followed Palpatine around, and was was always by his side when he gave speeches. We all know that the Emperor-to-be did reach out with the Force and touch the minds of his audience. Perhaps Masameta's staff could have something like an amplification to his power, a dark side microphone if you will. Again though, at this point, this is all purely speculation. However, it does make sense that these may be relics of the ancient Sith, as these are the literal beings that the ancient Sith were inspired by. As to why Palpatine specifically was interested in the Four Sage member Sistros is a bit more difficult to ascertain. Perhaps Sidious identified with her to some degree, as an individual powerful in the dark side of the Force and yet held so much political power at the same time. Or maybe there is something specific about the way Sistros conducted her power that Palpatine can't help but respect. Something very rare and nigh impossible to achieve to Palpatine is his respect. In fact, you could say that the only beings in the entire galaxy that ever gained the respect of Darth Sidious were Master Yoda and Darth Plagueis. It's clear though that he held some sort of reverence for the Four Sages, specifically Sistros. But as of now, his connection to the Four Sages, specifically Sistros, will remain a mystery. So the innate ability to use the cosmic energy field known as the Force has the potential to drastically alter alter the lives of force sensitive individuals. During the era of the Republic, these children were taken from their homes and inducted into the illustrious Jedi Order, where they were raised to become warriors of peace and hope across the galaxy. During the era of the Empire, however, we come to find out that force sensitive children are again taken from their homes, only it's not as clearly established where these children go, or what they are ultimately used by the Empire for. So what does the Empire do with force sensitive children? Where do they go? And what does Palpatine have in store for them once they get there. Well, stick with us, students of the Force, and let's discuss Palpatine's sinister plan for Force-sensitive children that began all the way back during the Age of the Clone War. 
Spoilers ahead for Kenobi Episode 3, and full spoilers ahead for Episode 4. An important distinction here to make is that we are not talking about the tomb shown in the latest episode of Kenobi, as these bodies were former members of the previous Jedi Order. Instead, we are talking about the children of the galaxy that are found to be Force-sensitive during the reign of the Empire, and are the children that Quinlan Vos and Tala have spent the last decade rescuing. These children have never been affiliated with the Jedi Order in any way. They are just children of the galaxy that are force sensitive, but for a breakdown on what these tombs were in the latest episode of Kenobi, be sure to check out our video on that as well. We do however have a canon answer for what Palpatine and the Empire does with these force sensitive children, and may I say these force sensitive children may suffer a fate worse than any Jedi. The answer in canon comes from a project simply known as the Star Wars book, which compiled contributions from the likes of Pablo Hidalgo, Cole Horton, and Dan Zare, each of whom are influential Star Wars creators in their own right. The plan proposed in this book is that the children were being utilized for an Imperial program known as Project Harvester. We first learn of Project Harvester and the plan that Palpatine has to steal Force-sensitive children during the very early days of the Clone Wars conflict. In the Clone Wars series, in fact, when Anakin Skywalker and his team are tasked with rescuing Force-sensitives that have been taken by a group of bounty hunters. While Palpatine's plan ultimately failed in the episode, and at this point in time, his grip on the galaxy after the war ended allowed him to carry out the remainder of this operation unopposed. At first, it was largely believed that these children would become Inquisitors, or agents of the Sith, but in truth, something far more sinister was at play here. During Project Harvester, the children that Palpatine took were sent to the planet known as Arcanus, where they would be raised under the tutelage of Palpatine's various Imperial agents. The purpose of Project Harvester was designed to turn these Force-sensitive children into spies of sorts for Palpatine. However, they would be far more nefarious in nature. They would be taught how to hone their Force abilities and use them to see various events and individuals from across the galaxy. Perhaps the darkest part of this plan, however, was how these children differed from the likes of the Inquisitors or Sith Assassins from Legends. Inquisitors, Sith Apprentices, and Sith Assassins are all seduced by the inherent power within the dark side that they can feel, and they choose to seek this power out of their own accord. Many of these Sith agents were former Jedi who already had an affinity with the Force and an understanding of how to use it, but these children taken during the Age of the Empire, were treated much differently and in a way that disqualified them from ever becoming Sith agents. The inherent flaw in training children to use the Force from such a young age is that Palpatine ran the risk of children growing powerful enough to overthrow him or usurp his rule, but yet he still needed spies. Therefore, he developed a different indoctrination tactic that helped mitigate this risk. Instead of seducing these children with the dark side, making them curious and wish to embrace the darkness within the Force, he instead broke their spirits through years of immense physical, psychological, and mental torment. While the Inquisitors and Sith agents had a choice to pursue the dark side, these children very much did not. From here, Palpatine would have a method of peering across the expanse of his entire empire, able to see through the eyes of these children, able to see the darkest corners that he himself would never have thought to search. This would shine a light on some of the most credible threats to his reign, and allowed him to act on these visions before his supremacy could ever be challenged or toppled. He believed that if he could see into the furthest reaches of the galaxy, then he would be able to find anyone who sought to oppose him, using these imprisoned and enslaved children as a window of sorts to peer through their plans and through their very eyes. This mentally crippled them and destroyed their will to fight back taking away from them their very presence and personality, and seeing as many of them were incredibly young, they were cursed with living out the entirety of their lives within Palpatine's imperial grasp. They had no personality because they never had time to develop one, nor did they have any semblance of humanity because their connections with their loved ones were severed at such a young age, meaning that they never grew up or developed socially, emotionally, or even in some cases physically. While the Jedi were likewise taken from a very young age, they still had social interactions within the Jedi Temple and even the innocence of the galaxy. They made friends with one another, explored the galaxy, and at least had some semblance of socialization, despite the fact that the Jedi Order itself was not a morally pure order as they claimed to be. These children, however, taken, stolen by Palpatine, did not have any hint of this and were presumably little more than cogs in a machine that worked on Palpatine's latest project. 
Even their training was believed to be incredibly specialized and severely limited, as the only use of the force that they ever learned was how to spy on the galaxy around them. None of them grew to have any sort of power within the force, simply because they were never taught how to use any other force abilities, nor were they ever taught how to channel it on their own benefit or for even combat purposes. It has even been theorized that they were barely even taught what the force was or what it is capable of, and they might have been simply taught that they had one specific ability and that it was their duty to perform it in the service of their emperor. If they learned the fullest extent of what they were capable of, then they might have been incentivized to break free or attempt to fight back, and Palpatine, of course, could not allow this. Therefore, he had to break them. With this operation underway, however, Palpatine was able to seek out many of his greatest threats to the Empire and dispatch agents to quell the uprisings from across the galaxy. This is in fact one of the many methods that Palpatine used to stay on top of any information being passed across the galaxy. Even operations that were conducted with the utmost secrecy and discretion were no match for the power of the Force, and several rebel schemes would have been sabotaged by this project. This left the deadliest agents of the Sith to continue their training, becoming inquisitors or apprentices in some other way, and allowing Palpatine to isolate these children in some of the coldest, harshest environments that the Empire had to offer. And it is our opinion here at the channel that these children suffered a much worse face than the Jedi that were hunted down during Order 66, as these children are entirely stripped of who they are, their loved ones, their very being, and are trained for one specific task even who they are is taken from them. But anyway, my friends, what do you think of Project Harvester? And did you know the purpose of Force-sensitive children and why they were taken in droves by the Empire? It should also be noted that it is known that Darth Vader, as well as the Inquisitors, have been known to personally take these Force-sensitive children and deliver them to Palpatine for his nefarious plan. If you Greetings everyone and welcome back to another video. The Grand Army of the Republic was made up of almost entirely that of clones from Jango Fett, program and race to be the most effective, efficient, and loyal super soldiers. The clones were one of the things that gave the Republic the true edge in their war against the Separatists and the Droid Army. They also played a major crucial role in the Great Jedi Purge, and the ushering in of a brand new order to the galaxy, as the clones slowly gained the trust of their Jedi commanders before the programming of Order 66 finally was initiated and they turned on them instantaneously. Though despite having a very involved hand in their creation and programming, Darth Sidious himself never truly trusted the clones. He knew that they would have an order that would alter their characteristics to serve him and him alone, and as a result of that, the Republic that he would now control. But he also likely knew of the other orders that they had implemented into their very minds that would have them turn against him too. Sidious knew that even though the clones were trained and essentially programmed to be loyal only to him, they still did have a modicum of free will, and so he never trusted them fully and even somewhat disliked them. Similarly to many Jedi, he viewed them as less than human. His dislike for the clone troopers was cemented by the clone trooper Fives during the Clone Wars arc, when Fives discovered his own inhibitor chip and attempted to unravel the grand plan of Sidious. All of his plans were nearly undone by a clone. All of Sidious's plans would have come crashing down, not because of the Jedi or the Great Force, but because of a single, unlucky clone trooper. So he was quick to replace the clone army when it came time for the Empire to eventually rise. However, there was one single clone trooper that Palpatine actually did trust trusted him so much that he became a captain in his personal royal guard. And in today's video, we will be talking about that clone trooper. The content from today comes from the novel Lords of the Sith, which is canon, as we enter when the Emperor and Vader, as well as a handful of royal red guards, are shot down. Shot down as they were on their way to assess the growing resistance and political tensions on the world of Ryloth. Luckily, Vader was able to stabilize the ship and land as safely as he could though only two of the Red Guards ultimately would survive the crash. After avoiding many dangers, the four of them found themselves marching through the Ryloth wilderness on their way to the Imperial outpost that was nearby. We learn of this clone trooper whenever they finally stop to rest and make camp for the first night. This is how the passage from the novel goes from Darth Vader's perspective. The captain of the Royal Guard sat on the ground across from them. You should remove your helmet, Captain, the Emperor said. It must wear on you to have that on all of the time. Thank you, my emperor, the captain said. He then removed his helmet to reveal a mind-familiar face to Vader. 
the scarred face of a clone trooper. The features, an echo of so many faces from Darth Vader's past. Rex, Cody, Fives, Echo, the roster of names moved through Vader's mind. Each of them, a trigger for a memory. Each of them, a ghost from his past. It is fascinating to me that a clone would have made it as far as he did within the ranks of the Empire, especially excelling to the position of captain amongst the Red Royal Guard. The Imperial Red Guard was a prestigious organization that trained their members exclusively to be the best. In the comic Crimson Empire, we get a flashback of what training was like to be an Imperial Royal Guard at the Academy on the planet of Incor. In the flashback, we see exactly 43 trainees present. Yet in the end, only one of them would actually graduate and become a part of the Royal Guard. These guards were instilled with absolute zealous loyalty to their Emperor, so much so that they would only obey him and would not even take orders from Vader, unless the Emperor directly gave them the go-ahead to do so. The Red Guard were also no normal soldiers. They were trained in what is known as the Achani Martial Arch, which was a system of combat that turned the person's body into a living weapon, and is also said to be able to perform perfectly counter a force user. The Red Guard trainees were honed into becoming superhuman with nothing else but pure skill within their bones. Despite the fact that many of them were non-force sensitive, they fought as if they were. Night and day, they were drilled and often dueled each other with punishment of failure, often being death. For every class of Red Guards, the Emperor would make an appearance to them find the one that was best among them, and have that one duel Lord Vader one-on-one -on -one in front of the other trainees. No matter how many came before him, obviously, none were ever a match for the skill of Vader, and he would kill them all in the end. This was to prove a point, and to show them that even their best was not good enough, and to protect the Emperor meant that they had to become better than any opponent, and if the best among their ranks was asked to die, they would die. In the very end, the two that remained in the top of the class were brought before the Emperor and forced to fight until victory, a fight to the death. The one who won the duel must execute the other, foregoing all friendship or bonds they would have made along the way in exchange for complete loyalty to one, Emperor Palpatine. This loyalty was in fact rewarded, as the Emperor often treated each of his Red Guards with respect and even a modicum of kindness, though if they ever fell behind, he would not hesitate to have them killed by one of their brothers in arms. As we saw in the passage, Sidious invited the Captain to remove his helmet, commenting that it must be very weary. The Captain quickly and graciously obliged him, not wanting to reject or take the Emperor's generosity for granted. Even when the Emperor made his appearance to the trainees at the Academy, they all knelt before him, and he insisted that they stand, telling them that he would like to speak with those who gave up so much for loyalty to him alone, and praised them by telling them that their sacrifice honored him. By showing these small gestures of respect, it garnered even more of an undying loyalty to their one emperor. When the Empire fell, the news of the Emperor's death reached the ears of the Red Guard. Many of them committed suicide as a result of this, as they felt that they had failed him. Others continued to fight on for the cause of the Empire. This clone captain of the Red Guard survived until the very end of the book, faithfully serving the Emperor along the way, as not much is known about what happened to him afterwards. Though I suspect that the captain was kept very close to Sidious, as he and the other guard were one of the only guards who actually saw Sidious use his light saber as well as the force. Some of the few individuals that Darth Sidious trusted with the information that he was in fact a Sith Lord. Sidious trusted them so much that he allowed them to see him for what he truly was without fear of them taking anything from it, or telling anyone about it ever, even discussing it amongst each other. This is also Palpatine's kindest gesture towards a clone that we've ever seen in the entirety of nearly all of Star Wars lore, legends included. Again though, this is canon. And this is likely the only clone trooper that Palpatine ever trusted. Not only did he trust him, but he trusted him with his life. It is unclear what exactly was so special about this clone trooper, whether or not he was closest to Jango Fett, and was a near-perfect specimen trained from birth specifically to be a Red Royal Guard when Sidious rose to power, or if he was more of a commonplace clone trooper that proved himself in battle time and time again. But what we can confirm though, is that this is one of the most skilled and powerful clone troopers that will ever appear in Star Wars canon, standing to the left of Sidious himself, as well as the only clone trooper that Sidious ever trusted with his life, and the only one that he ever liked.
But anyway, students of the Force, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on this single clone captain? The Supreme Leader Snoke is a very controversial figure and topic in the Star Wars fandom overall. His appearance in The Force Awakens caused the fanbase to explode about theories about who this mysterious Darksider was. What were his intentions? And how was he able to sway someone as powerful as Ben Solo from the Skywalker bloodline back to the path of the dark side? Supreme Leader Snoke was essentially set up as the main antagonist of the sequel trilogy, until this was, well, all altered by Ryan Johnson, who decided to kill Supreme Leader Snoke in The Last Jedi. In The Rise of Skywalker, we sort of get a rudimentary introduction about the purpose of Supreme Leader Snoke, however, he's touched upon only in a single line in the film. So this has still led those of us who are still curious, myself included, to ask what was the true purpose of Supreme Leader Snoke? How was he originally envisioned by Darth Sidious and created by the acolytes that lie on Exegol? What was the true purpose of Snoke? Is he related to Palpatine in some way? And could he actually be more important than many fans give him credit for. Before we delve into a ton of the information that is revealed in The Secrets of the Sith novel, which is a book told from Palpatine's point of view, as he sort of breaks down the Sith and various Darksiders that appear in Star Wars canon, explaining their purpose in his master plan and the ultimate idea that he wants to create a dyad with Darth Vader and why this failed. But that topic is for another video. In the book Secrets of the Sith, which was released several months ago, we actually get a lot of indicators as to exactly what the true purpose of Supreme Leader Snoke was, with the novel revealing in great detail that Supreme Leader Snoke is actually far more ambitious and important to the overall sequel trilogy than many fans give him credit for. I'm not saying that Snoke isn't a complete failure of a character, but essentially the release of these books gives us a better idea of the true purpose of Supreme Leader Snoke and the explanation for the character. We should have seen all of this stuff on screen, but now thanks to these novels, this is basically the full picture of what we should have gotten on the big screen. So if you're interested in that, as we break down Supreme Leader Snoke and his plan to overthrow Palpatine that was revealed to us in The Secrets of the Sith. To begin, the book explains the origins of Supreme Leader Snoke, as apparently he was one of the first things that the Darksiders on Exegol created. It is stated that Supreme Leader Snoke may have even been an early contingency plan for Darth Sidious, and was supposed to be a body that Darth Sidious could have inhabited after his original physical body died. It's also known that this experiment ultimately failed, but Snoke as a result became became sentient. He was only supposed to be a vessel for Palpatine to possess in the first place. However, Palpatine saw a great use for him, as it is revealed that Palpatine managed to create a Darksider using cloning technology, specifically though not Palpatine's DNA, and that he was largely successful in this. And while he was unable to possess the body because of the simple fact that it was not a clone of Palpatine, Snoke himself gained sentience. It is here where Supreme Leader Snoke's role becomes much bigger. Darth Sidious and the scientists on Exegol decide to make Snoke the frontman of the First Order, an offshoot of the Empire to essentially keep the New Republic and the Jedi distracted. Although Palpatine doesn't like it, the Book of the Sith goes on to explain that Supreme Leader Snoke was trained as a sort of pseudo-apprentice. The way I have it in my head is Supreme Leader Snoke is sort of like the Asajj Ventress of the Clone Wars. He's someone who is not a Sith Lord but is very much dark side in allegiance and serves the Sith. However, because of the fact that Palpatine attempted to possess this body, and wanted an individual with insane force potential, Supreme Leader Snoke is exceptionally powerful in the dark side of the force, and is quite possibly one of the most talented force users in the entire Star Wars galaxy, because essentially he's designed to be the perfect dark sider. This also likely goes into why Supreme Leader Snoke is so deformed, because he has all of this unruly dark side energy within him, and the dark side is essentially corroding and corrupting his body, similar to we see the decay of Darth Sidious and other dark side. But this is where the character of Snoke gets much more interesting. It is revealed in The Secrets of the Sith that Darth Sidious never trusted anyone from the Skywalker bloodline after Darth Vader. He essentially reveals that although Ben Solo, Kylo Ren, is exceptionally talented in the dark side of the Force, he does not wish to train him as his apprentice. As Darth Sidious senses the mind of Ben Solo, and senses that the light side of the Force is ever prevalent there, and although he was unable to sense the light side of the Force in Vader until the very, very end, he can always sense its presence within Ben Solo. However, this is where Snoke has a different idea. Snoke, on the other hand, has different plans for Kylo Ren Ben Solo. Palpatine's original goal is only to have Kylo Ren bring Rey to him. That is the only purpose in which he sees for Kylo Ren. That, and overall, he's simply a puppet. Snoke, on the other hand, though, seeks to train Kylo Ren as his true apprentice, something that Darth Sidious never really wanted. This is why the in the novel The Secrets of 
the Sith, it is explained why Snoke wants Kylo Ren to kill Rey in The Last Jedi. As we learned in The Rise of Skywalker, if Rey were to be killed in The Last Jedi, it would make no sense for Palpatine's grand plan, as Rey is the keystone for his plan and he wants to possess her body. So if she's killed, his plan goes up in flames, which is exactly what Snoke wants. This is Supreme Leader Snoke's power play against Darth Sidious in this moment. He realizes that potentially, with the combined might of Kylo Ren, as well as himself, that they may be able to overthrow Darth Sidious, who is currently dying on Exegol, and Snoke senses this. However, just as Palpatine foresaw, and Snoke failed to see, Ben Solo does have a bit of the light side within him, and remains loyal to Rey, wanting to take over the First Order for himself, with in this case, Palpatine not making the same mistake that he had before in fully trusting a Skywalker, something in the book he promises himself he will never do again. Snoke, on the other hand, believed that he could use Kylo Ren to overthrow Darth Sidious, especially if they can kill Rey. If they can kill Rey, then this will mark the complete end of Lord Sidious as we know it, as he will no longer be able to possess someone of his bloodline, and the lineage of Palpatine will end here, with essentially Snoke and Kylo Ren being the reigning darksiders of the entire Star Wars galaxy. This is Supreme Leader Snoke's plan, and this is the plan that ultimately crumbles and falls apart, just as Sidious predicted. So let's explain why the creators over at Lucasfilm made this change with Supreme Leader Snoke. The way I see it, this is sort of a middle ground between the Snoke that we got in the films and what Snoke was built up in our own minds to be. He's his own character with his own dark side plots, and although he's so quickly thrown aside in The Last Jedi, this book does sort of help with a viable explanation. The importance of Supreme Leader Snoke was very much overblown by the Star Wars fan base and very much heavily diminished by the Star Wars creatives. So instead, we get this middle ground of a character whose overall plot is more akin to the likes of Dooku or a Ventress, a halfway apprentice to a revived Darth Sidious, whose original goal was supposed to be the inhabitable body of Sidious's dead spirit, something that ultimately failed, but this Snoke was repurposed. But with him being repurposed, he grows more ambitious and powerful, believing himself to have been more powerful than Darth Sidious, but unable to challenge the rule of Sith, as Snoke himself is not a Sith. Therefore, he attempts to overthrow Darth Sidious through killing Rey and by using Ben Solo. Again, what's unfortunate about all of this is this is all information that we're receiving about Snoke after the fact. Information that admittedly makes his character more interesting, but is a little bit late. To their credit though, after the secrets of the Sith novel, I do find Snoke to be a way more interesting character. But now I turn it over to you. What Master Yoda is often regarded as one of the most influential Jedi Masters in the history of the galaxy, with a 900 year life span that has seen some of the most significant events in galactic history. Master Yoda is one of the most skillful, most powerful, and most experienced Jedi Masters of his era and potentially of all time. As Grand Master of the Jedi Order, he directly oversaw everything that the Order of the Republic did throughout the era of the Clone War, guiding from his centuries of wisdom in order to build the Jedi Order into the epitome of what he believed the Jedi could and should be. Yoda's duel with Palpatine in the Senate Chambers served as a landmark event in the Clone Wars conflict and in the trajectory of the galactic history, as this was the culmination of not only the Clone Wars conflict, but the culmination of the millennia of old rivalry between the Jedi and the Sith Orders. Yoda's defeat at the hands of the Emperor directly ushered in the era of the Galactic Empire, and while the Emperor was able to erect his forces in glorious fashion, he was well aware of Yoda's survival at the end of their duel and at the end of Revenge of the Sith. While he assigns the clone armada to continue searching for Yoda throughout the Jedi Temple, why did Palpatine seemingly abandon the search for the Grand Master? Why was Palpatine unable to find the aging Jedi Master in the coming years despite knowing that Yoda was most certainly alive, as well as held the most promising chance of challenging Palpatine's newly formed Galactic Empire? We'll stick with us today, weary acolytes of the galaxy, and let's explore this idea. And why did Palpatine stop his search for Grandmaster Yoda? While Palpatine is an arrogant individual and believes himself to be superior to the Jedi Order, including Yoda, he is not stupid. And the closing minutes of Revenge of the Sith illustrate this perfectly. Upon hearing that the clones have yet to find the body of Yoda, he understands that this means Yoda is not dead. And he orders the troops to double their search, though Yoda would ultimately slip through their fingers and escape to the distant planet of Dagobah. The simple answer as to why he ultimately didn't abandon his search immediately, and in fact, he tried to find Yoda for many years following the events of Revenge of the Sith. It would be around two decades, though, before Palpatine would hear of the ultimate demise of Grandmaster Yoda through prodding through the mind of Luke Skywalker 
Skywalker in Return of the Jedi. But still, why did he abandon his search in the two decades prior to this? The most interesting part of Yoda's exile is that the choice of planet in which he ultimately chose to reside on, that being Dagobah. And he chose Dagobah not simply by chance, but for a very specific reason. Dagobah was far from a simple swampland that it appeared to be on the surface, as it served as one of the purest planets within the fabric of the Force, and by proxy, had one of the strongest Force energies of the known planets within the galaxy. The Force itself draws its energy from life, and as Obi-Wan describes it in A New Hope, it's an energy field created by all living things becoming intertwined. And Dagobah was one of the strongest Force Nexus planets planets in the galaxy, particularly due to the abundance of natural life that had flourished without the intervention of sentient species, species who might seek to colonize the planet and erect cities. Dagobah is simply filled with more life than a common planet. This particular strength within the Force meant that the energy fields of Dagobah were perfect for hiding a figure of Yoda's stature and immense Force potential, with his own signature in the Force becoming masked, as Yoda's species is widely regarded as one of the most naturally Force-gifted species in the history of Star Wars. His presence in the Force was strong enough to be felt by numerous Force sensitives, and we've seen particularly powerful Force users leave tremors throughout the galaxy that can be detected by other Force wielders. This meant that while on Dagobah, Yoda essentially essentially had no Force signature, and with the planet being so far removed from the rest of the Central Empire, Palpatine simply never ventured close enough to the elusive Swampland to find Yoda. Not to mention that Dagobah had a distinct dark side of the Force adherence, meaning that Yoda's light side signature was hidden perfectly. If anyone got close enough to Dagobah in order to sense Yoda, they would instead see a conflicted, chaotic planet ripe with untamed energy within the Force, and this would deter most searchers from believing that this unkept Swampland was the house of one of the most prolific Jedi Masters in galactic history. This even led Luke Skywalker, one of the most powerful Force sensitives in the galaxy, and the heir to one of the most immeasurably powerful Force bloodlines in galactic history, being able to come and go to train with the Grand Master, without the Empire suspecting a thing. All of this, however, does not mean that Palpatine actually abandoned his search for Yoda, as Palpatine actually put out massive bounties on the Grand Master, seeking the help of bounty hunters as well as the Inquisitors, as well as Lord Vader, putting Yoda as the most wanted individual in galactic history and just directly below him, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Because of the massive bounty, many individuals and bounty hunters of the galaxy would actually bring Palpatine fake Yodas, killing small targets and then dressing them up to look like the Grand Master. In the end though, Yoda was safely hidden away on Dagobah, and Palpatine believed himself to be too important to directly go search for him. In Palpatine's mind, it was believed that Darth Vader's final test would in fact be Grand Master Yoda, and that one day, Vader would eventually be able to hunt down Yoda. However, he wasn't going to waste his time looking for a Grand Master whose order was long dead. He fully understood the significance of finding and killing Yoda once and for all. The fact simply remains that despite the immense array of power and resources that both the Empire and Palpatine alike had at their disposal, he simply did not have the reach necessary to track the Grand Master down, especially because this was not Palpatine's immediate goal at the time. His more immediate goal was establishing the Empire. This carries with it numerous pressing responsibilities that had to be addressed personally and Palpatine was only able to delegate the search for Master Yoda and other Jedi survivors to his underlings, which later led to the establishment of various Inquisitors who specialized in hunting down Jedi, although none of them were powerful enough to ultimately hunt down the Grand Master or even locate him. However, these Inquisitors would have most certainly been aware of who Yoda was and the threat that he posed, and many of them would have been finding Yoda be their top priority although none of them would succeed. With Darth Vader serving as Palpatine's immediate right-hand man, the search for Obi-Wan Kenobi and Master Yoda did in fact progress for the following decades, though it proved that they ultimately outsmarted the Empire, with Yoda, as well as Obi-Wan Kenobi, able to evade Darth Vader and the Inquisitors, as well as the Emperor and the remainder of his forces. Eventually, Palpatine eventually moved all of his resources away from finding the Jedi, as he believed no matter if Yoda and Obi-Wan were still out there, there was no 
no way that they could rise yet again, as he believed them to be relics of an order long past. The collection of these individual factors all ultimately culminated with Yoda's ultimate survival for the greater part of the next two decades, with Dagobah shielding Yoda from Palpatine who was already immensely preoccupied with his current responsibilities under the newly forged regime. In the end, Palpatine simply grew bored and believed that Yoda, even as powerful as he had once been, was no longer a threat to his newly founded empire. Not to mention that Palpatine believed that he had fully broken Yoda's spirits during their last duel. Not only had he defeated him hand to hand and with his abilities within the Force, but Palpatine's plan had ultimately come to full fruition and he defeated Yoda and the Jedi within his mind. But anyway my friends, what are your thoughts on this explanation for why Palpatine ultimately gave up on looking for Yoda? And the final duel between the light and the dark with the galaxy at stake was left unfinished between Master Yoda and Darth Sidious on Coruscant. As soon as the two were separated by the intense blast of their power, that would be the very last time that Sidious and Yoda ever looked into each other's eyes. The fury of the force within the Senate chamber would echo its symphony for years to come. For a long time, it has been debated as to whether or not Sith could interact with Jedi Force ghosts or not, with only a few minor legend stories implying that they actually have. However, my friends, today we bring you something incredibly interesting from a new canon novel called Stories of the Jedi and Sith. We have discovered in one of these short stories that immediately after Yoda died on Dagobah in Return of the Jedi, his ghost paid the Emperor a direct visit. This is incredibly significant to Star Wars canon and a massive update, and this will be the only time that the Avatar of the Light and the Embodiment of the Dark have met in over 20 years. So my friends, without further ado, let's get into today's tale. The chapter is quite short, as we open on Palpatine ruminating in the second Death Star above Endor. In the days of triumph over the Rebel Alliance, he thinks about his own accomplishments and how he will soon be the undefeated Emperor of the entire galaxy galaxy with the rebels crushed. As his thoughts begin to stray a little, he couldn't help but remember his old rival, the little green creature, Jedi Grandmaster Yoda. His thoughts soon go to reminisce about their battle in the Senate chambers. The Emperor remembers how exhilarating it felt to battle someone who actually matched him, and someone who had kept up with him toe to toe for nearly the entire engagement. While he respected Master Yoda as a combatant, the fight was little more than playtime, something for Sidious to do while he basked in his triumph over the the Jedi. Even though Yoda had escaped, Sidious has no problem with it because he knows that he won, and as long as Yoda remained alive, Sidious would have continued to win over the Grand Master, which is something that he wanted. The Emperor of the Galaxy can't help but fantasize about killing the Jedi Grand Master though, thinking that it would still give him great pleasure to run his red blade through the little green creature. We even learned that he had given the Inquisitors and all of the Imperial probe droids the information and very well thorough specs on Yoda, as well as a very hefty bounty on the creature's head. Palpatine even admits to considering using some sort of Sith ritual to create an echo in the Force to give him a lead on where Yoda's location may be. However, it was all overkill and he decided it wasn't really worth his time in the end. He had won. And now, as he looked over the stars out of the viewpoint of the Death Star, he cackles as he knows that in a few short weeks, he will have eradicated all traces of the former Republic. Across the galaxy on Dagobah, Yoda slips into his bed as Luke crouches into the hut. Yoda's mind is far from his old rival and he is focused only on the here and the now, the presence of the Force. The familiar scene of Yoda's death plays out as he transcends into the Force, leaving his corporeal body behind. The description that we get after Yoda becomes one with the Force is beautiful, but also shows us the training that Yoda took from Qui-Gon Jinn in action as he becomes a Force ghost and transcends the physical plane. Here is what the passage from the new book says. The Force is wondrous. Master Yoda is no longer a piece of it. He is it, but he remembers himself as he was taught. He remembers who he is, who he has been. He remembers who he will be, though he does not breathe. He remembers how to laugh. But something out there in the galaxy also remembers him and is calling his name right now. After this, we transition back to the Emperor, who immediately knows that Yoda is dead. He explains that it wasn't as if he had felt Yoda and then suddenly didn't feel him. No, he hadn't felt Yoda at all, and now he suddenly did feel the Jedi all around him in the Force itself. He hadn't felt Yoda or sensed him in the Force, and now suddenly he did feel the Jedi all around him. His anger flared but he realized that Yoda was now dead. This made Palpatine laugh even more. But then, 
His laughs were silence, as from the cosmos a blue glow manifested into existence, taking the form of his old rival. Yoda stood there as a force ghost, just staring at Palpatine. The Emperor is shocked and says nothing for a long moment, not even knowing if what is appearing before him is even real. Nevertheless, he finally bites out a laugh and says, you are dead. Palpatine turns away in his throne to look out at the viewport and begins to gloat, asking Yoda if he had come to witness the final glory and ultimate triumph of the Sith. Sidious begins taunting him and telling him that he will soon own Luke Skywalker just as he did his master in Vader. Yoda only has one simple thing to tell Sidious though, win you cannot. Sidious laughs and responds that he has already won, but as he turns to look upon Yoda's frown, the Spectre is gone. This extremely brief interaction is all we get between the two masters, but I think that this is incredibly significant as Yoda essentially knew what was going to happen. Yoda was now a part of the Force and could sense that Darth Sidious would never win. Being one with the Force, the Master was undoubtedly privy to knowing the future to some extent, and he wasn't taunting Sidious any farther when he said that he couldn't win. He was just stating that Yoda, now a part of the Force itself, believed that he never would, and was simply stating a fact. Sidious would learn this all too late when Vader would turn against him at the end of the Battle of Endor. I do not believe that Yoda saw everything, as even when Obi-Wan Kenobi was a Force ghost, he did not believe that Darth Vader could be turned back to the light side of the Force and become Anakin yet again. But I also believe that Yoda's comments go a bit deeper. Yoda has now finally achieved the one thing that Darth Sidious desires more than anything else in eternal life. Sidious and all of the Sith in general desire to live forever, and it was Darth Plagueis' main goal to cheat death by using the machinations of the dark side. However, in the end, they can never do this, so instead of taking this final moment to gloat before Darth Sidious for achieving what he never is able to, he simply departs, letting him know that he is now one with the Force and that Darth Sidious is essentially the first person that Yoda decides to visit. He decides to visit Darth Sidious before even Luke, a final part to his greatest rival in that of the Sith. And now, full well knowing that he is one with the Force, and completely a part of the Force itself. In this moment, Darth Sidious is even a little bit shaken, and is awestruck at the fact that Yoda is now all around him. The idea that he could not sense him before, but that now Yoda is a literal part of the Force itself is amazing. But anyway my friends, what are your thoughts on this? And what are your thoughts on this brand new addition to Star Wars lore and Star Wars canon? And now officially, we know that the first person that Yoda decided to visit once he transcended the physical plane was none other than Darth Sidious in his rival, who just so happened to be thinking directly of Yoda in this moment. What are your thoughts on this in their very final, very brief interaction? As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching. Please remember that this is now Star Wars canon, and this is a pretty major addition, and may the Force be with you. You will not stop me. Soon, Darth Vader will become more powerful than either of us. These simple words spoken by the newly crowned Galactic Emperor to the former Grand Master of the Jedi have been either overlooked or misunderstood for a long time now. The reason being that despite what he just stated, it never seems like Sidious is at all eager to relinquish his position to his apprentice as it is stated in the Rule of Two. Never does he want to submit to Darth Vader. In fact, it seems quite the opposite. Palpatine takes extensive measures to keep Vader in his place, constantly seeks for replacements, and overall seems to almost disregard his apprentice at every chance that Vader isn't immediately proving useful, all while smiling to him and pretending to be his friend. Despite having Vader as an apprentice and spending a great deal of time trying to get Anakin into the role of Darth Vader, we never actually see Sidious training Anakin or Vader in any capacity whatsoever. For the most part, it seems that Vader just follows Sidious' orders for whatever mission or errand he needs him to run at any given moment. This too is contradicted by the fact that Sidious puts on a facade of training by occasionally offering Vader a couple of wise words and talking him out of making poor decisions. However, any form of training is very hands-off on behalf of Palpatine, and we can't help but wonder and ponder on exactly why this is. Why, after everything he went through to acquire Anakin as his new Sith apprentice, has Sidious not bothered to actually
actually give him any formal training that we have witnessed? Well, perhaps today we have the answer to this long-awaited question. First though, according to our analytics, many of you haven't subscribed to us yet. Don't worry, we won't make the same mistakes that Sidious made, and we will train you in the ways of the Force. Just hit the subscribe button for daily Star Wars content just like this. Now, students of the Force and acolytes of the galaxy, let us begin. When Sidious said that Darth Vader would become more powerful than either himself or Yoda, he meant it. At this point in time, Sidious was still abiding by the Rule of Two doctrine, and after many years, he believed that he had finally found the ultimate apprentice, the final, most powerful Sith Lord of them all, Darth Vader. Ever since he met young Anakin on Naboo, after single-handedly ending the droid crisis by destroying the Trade Federation control ship, Palpatine always meant it when he said that he would be watching Anakin's career with great interest. During that conversation, he could likely feel the Force itself dripping off of Anakin's very being. The Chosen One had arrived, and Sidious didn't have to do much just yet. He knew the boy was far too resilient for the Jedi to work with, and the work would be done for him by the Jedi's dogma and disillusioning the boy. Of course, with careful prodding and subtle manipulations over the years, at the end of the Clone Wars, it was finally time for all of his manipulations to pay off. After he had witnessed a bit of Anakin's anger in the battle with Dooku before, Palpatine organized his own capture and instructed Dooku to take out Obi-Wan early in their duel so that he could watch and gauge Anakin's power for himself firsthand. He also told Dooku to goad Skywalker into the dark side. Soon though, Dooku was forced on the backpedal and actually began fighting for his life once he realized that Anakin had crossed that threshold. And finally, with two words, Sidious sealed Anakin's fate, and Dooku's as well. Those two words were do it. From here, it was a slippery slope, and once Obi-Wan was out of the picture to deal with Grievous, Palpatine finally had Anakin where he wanted him, and Darth Vader was soon born. Everything was going according to plan, and just as Palpatine had perfectly foreseen it, and then Mustafar happened. During the duel with Yoda, Sidious had been focused on finally giving the Jedi Master everything that he deserved. It was only after their duel did the dark side whisper to Sidious, and he felt a great disturbance within the Force. This is why Palpatine stopped looking for Yoda immediately after he quietly said, I sense Lord Vader is in danger. After Mustafar, Anakin was left irreparably crippled, and Palpatine's plans were left irreparably destroyed. All those years of manipulation and planning practically went down the drain instantly. He had the Empire, sure, and the Jedi were defeated, granted, but his true prize, the immortalization of the Sith through the turn chosen one, was lost in a literal fiery blaze. As he watched Anakin's burned body writhing around on the operating table, his disappointment was immeasurable and undescribable. He was furious with his apprentice and the fact that he had lost and now the rule of two could never continue with him in his current state. Yes, Vader's strength in the force remained, but his form was far too weak and his emotional state far too erratic for him to ever claim the title of the Dark Lord of the Sith and Emperor of the galaxy. So as Vader was becoming the technological terror we know today, Sidious came to an important decision. The rule of two was over. It was now time for the rule of one. Sidious's philosophy was to essentially become the ultimate being, the final Sith. He would have cultists and underlings, but unlike the Sith Emperors of old, he would not allow any of them to rise against his might because they would not be true Sith, simply his followers, his slaves. He saw that he needed to live forever as the only one true Sith Lord, but then there was still the factor of Darth Vader. Vader was far too powerful to be thrown away without nary a thought, and yet, far too weak to become the ultimate Sith that Sidious had dreamed of. The relationship between them had now become a very complicated one. Sidious tried time and time again to put plans in place to have Vader destroyed. However, each of them fell through as Vader proved to be too powerful to simply be defeated by any other force wielder. And yet, Vader could never overthrow the Emperor at all by himself. They were at a stalemate. They both knew exactly what the other was thinking and Vader even called Palpatine out on trying to replace him several times. But neither could overcome the other. They were stuck with each other. Now they had to simply play the game and pretend to be friends as they entered a secret race to outpace the other. 
Palpatine tried many times to find a suitable apprentice, but no other being even matched Vader's strength, much less exceeded it. So he had to do with the next best thing which was keeping Vader as down as low as possible. He made sure that his suit was weakening and uncomfortable as he could. And this is where we finally circle back to the topic at hand. He kept as many secrets from Vader as possible. Secrets of the dark side that Sidious would have willingly given to a fully formed Darth Vader. But now he was so much less. This is the revelation as to why he never trained him. He forced Vader to reteach himself lightsaber combat and how to utilize the dark side to his own advantage without Palpatine's direct help. Palpatine refused to teach him formally, in fact. And because of this, Vader would never uncover the secrets that Sidious knew. In the past, Sith Lords kept knowledge from their apprentices in order to make them struggle for it so that they would get stronger. They would feed their apprentices just enough knowledge for them to keep going. However, this instance was much different. It was no longer the rule of two. It was the rule of the one true emperor and Sidious was determined to ensure that his rule was an everlasting one. He could not let Vader uncover the secrets of the dark side and use them to become stronger or overthrow Sidious, believing Vader to be an inferior ruler. And because of this, he told Darth Vader very, very little as pertaining to the secrets of the Sith. Many wonder why Vader doesn't upgrade his suit or take the risk of switching out of his systems to an upgraded version. Well, his condition was so severe that he couldn't survive more than a few seconds without his breathing systems and his life support system. This being the case, he didn't trust droids or humans to be fast enough to complete the transfer and he wasn't strong enough to sustain himself in the force long enough for this transfer to happen. However, suppose that Vader had the knowledge of Sith sorcery and alchemy that Sidious hoarded for himself. Perhaps this transfer would not only be successful, but Vader would become far, far more powerful. Palpatine knew this. He knew that if he trained Vader at all, then his apprentice would figure out how to best sustain himself and fashion a superior armor that was powerful enough to restore his physical form and get out of under Sidious's thumb. But I'm sure you are all saying, wouldn't Sidious want this? And to that I say, by now, Sidious did not. You see, the rule of two was absolute, and Sidious no longer thought the rule of two to be necessary. He believed that he was the last of the line of the rule of two, and the chosen Sith Ari. After the rise of the Empire, Sidious watched Vader and noted how unruly he was, how he had no future vision beyond his failures, his dead wife, and his lust for Jedi blood. Vader was unfit to become the Emperor, and Sidious did not trust the Empire that the Sith had been building for a thousand years in the hands of someone as emotional as Vader was. So my friends, what are your thoughts on this explanation? Greetings Acolytes, and welcome back to the channel. In the rising days of the Empire, Darth Vader's entire focus was set purely on hunting and finding Kenobi. After Order 66, there was still a certain number of Jedi still alive left in the galaxy. Although their numbers, which were previously 10,000, were now diminished to only 100. After everything was said and done, we know that there were only a very tight few Jedi left in the galaxy by the time of Luke Skywalker. For a long time, it seemed as though the only two Jedi that were left behind were Ben Kenobi and Yoda. Ahsoka and Ezra at the time were long gone and on their own paths during the time of the Galactic Civil War. This was because of the Empire's ruthless hunt for anyone claiming to be a part of the Jedi religion or allying with the Jedi. Jedi ideologies or religion in any way. Palpatine made sure to destroy even the Church of the Wills, who were a closely Jedi-related religious organization despite not containing any Force sensitives whatsoever. Although we have covered Vader's Jedi hunting exploits in great detail on the channel, one thing still stands out, despite Palpatine ensuring that the Jedi stayed underground. He never seemed to worry about hunting the greatest of them, Yoda, and Vader also never gave any indication or desire of hunting the Grand Master. So why is this? Why did the Empire forsake the hunt for arguably the most dangerous and certainly the most powerful Jedi in the galaxy at the time? First though, according to our analytics, a lot of you guys that watch the channel haven't actually subscribed yet, so if you've been enjoying the Star Wars content and want to keep up to date with everything Star Wars related, force crush that subscribe button. The answer to this question comes in layers and has to be looked at from several points of view. 
but the most important perspective is that of the Emperor's. Many times, in both the books as well as the comics, Darth Vader and his master come into conflict about their opposing views regarding the urgency of the Jedi hunt. Vader thought that the hunt was paramount, and that any and all remaining Jedi were an absolute major threat to the Empire. However, Sidious thought of it quite differently. The Emperor's nonchalant attitude towards the remaining Jedi stemmed from the fact that he knew that the Empire had won, and he wanted all remaining Jedi to live just a little longer and watch as their galaxy is taken over completely by the Sith. This included, of the utmost importance, his own rival, Yoda. Palpatine was well aware of Yoda's survival. After their duel, he had the Coruscant Guard on high alert to look for the Jedi Grandmaster after he fell that great height from the Senate pod. After the clone troopers reported that they didn't find a body, he told them to double their searches. This was until he felt a disturbance in the Force, that Vader was in great danger. The clone troopers never found Yoda, so Palpatine reasonably assumed that he had fled and was now in hiding. In all honesty, this suited the Emperor just fine, as he knew that somewhere out in the galaxy, Yoda was wallowing in his a complete and utter failure. Sidious took a great measure of sinister delight in knowing that his enemies, and especially his greatest rival, were having to hide themselves and live in the dark like the Sith had to for a millennia under the tenets of Bane and the Rule of Two. But now, Emperor Palpatine was far more concerned with the state of the Empire and consolidating as much power as possible while building up the Empire. Unfortunately though, for the time being, his apprentice didn't share that same sentiment, nor passion for the Empire. While Sidious was nonchalant, Darth Vader was hellbent on finding and killing the Jedi that had remained of the Republic. It wasn't enough for him to know that they were suffering under the tyranny of the Empire and being forced to stand by helplessly. Vader wanted blood. He wanted to drink their fear as he drove the life from their bodies by his own blade. He had a bone to pick with the Jedi, and it had become personal. His revenge couldn't be satiated until he slew his old master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. It would take several incultations by Sidious and a bad experience before Vader would realize just how destructive his habits were for himself. But how does this relate to Yoda, the Grandmaster? Well, we aren't really given an idea of what Vader thought regarding the Jedi Grandmaster, but it wasn't something that was on the top of his hit list for sure. We could speculate that perhaps Vader knew deep down that in his new state, it was laughable to think that he could face Yoda's power and skill. However, we here at the channel do not believe this. Another speculation we could offer as to why Sidious didn't bother sending Vader to find Yoda is perhaps also he knew that Vader would not be able to stand up to him. And Sidious perhaps wasn't ready to gamble with his greatest prize against a foe that was more or less irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. What I believe though is that Vader and Yoda would have been very closely matched in terms of skill with the lightsaber as well as even potential in the force, and Vader did have a decent chance of defeating Yoda. But at the same time, Yoda also had a decent chance at stopping Lord Vader, and Sidious was not willing to risk this for someone that caused no foreseeable threat to the Empire. Now though, all of this was not to say that the Emperor didn't want Yoda to be found, there was a bounty set on Yoda by the Empire, and it was a handsome bounty indeed. So handsome, in fact, that the Empire was getting an overwhelming number of false claims by bounty hunters attempting to collect on the Empire's prize. The Imperials were bombarded by so many of these false claims that they had to change the rules concerning the bounty. Firstly, they wanted Yoda alive, and any claims found to be false would result in capital punishment, up to and including death by the counter fitter. Yoda's chosen destination was a true stroke of genius though, and wisdom on par with his reputation. The Dagobah system was a planet that was far out of the way, in the back of the Outer Rim. It has once been a Separatist-controlled system, but after that was abolished, no one really laid claim to the Swamp World despite its appearance on numerous star maps. Not to mention the power of the Dark Side Nexus located in the cave on Dagobah was strong enough to hide Master Yoda's impressive signature in the Force. Yoda was both hiding in and out of plain sight at the time. There was actually a time that Vader sent out a search party purely to indulge a small part of his curiosity, but after they came back empty-handed, Palpatine waved it off completely. During one of Sidious and Vader's many conversations on the topic of the Jedi, Sidious laughed in Vader's face after Vader had mentioned that the Jedi pose a significant threat to the Empire. Sidious then said he defeated Mace Windu, one of the Order's most powerful Jedi, 
and not even Yoda could stop him. Sidious would then go on to say that he had plans ready in case any Jedi ever did try to rise up again. The Emperor then dismissed Lord Vader with no inkling of what these plans may have been, which greatly perturbed the Dark Lord as he was now beginning to wonder if his master trusted him at all. Well friends, what are your take on this apathetic view of searching for the former Jedi Grandmaster on behalf of Palpatine? Do you think it was in the Empire's best interest to have focused their resources elsewhere? And if they had found Yoda, do you think there could have been anything Vader or the Empire could do at all to have triumphed over him? Do you think that Vader and Yoda were a match for one another? Let us know your thoughts on this down below. And as always, may the Force be with you and have a great day. Throughout the course of his life, Emperor Palpatine has seldom been significantly challenged in either the political arena or the field of physical combat, as his skills in both corner are largely unmatched to this day. As the greatest rival to the Jedi Order, a gifted manipulator and talented duelist, his greatest fears and most dire threats to his rule could often be addressed by his own incredibly diverse skill set. Political rivals that stood in his way could be manipulated, much like how he had Chancellor Valorum removed from office to make way for his own election. And in the arena of combat, even the most gifted warriors would fall victim to his blade, leaving Sidious seemingly utterly undefeatable. Throughout the war, he balanced each of these skills with precision and grace, giving off an aura of invincibility. So then, this raises an important question. Why did he come to fear one particular individual who had formerly served as his greatest asset? Who could cause Palpatine to grow weary and cautious during the dying days of the Republic despite him having all of the power he could need to defend himself? Well, today, students of the Force, let's dive into why Palpatine grew fearful of none other than his very own apprentice, former Jedi Master Dooku. First though, according to our records, many of the Force attuned that have visited our archives have not yet joined our order. So if you've been enjoying the daily openings of Holocrons, be sure to reach out and force crush that subscribe button. Now, let us begin. Recently, we released and produced a video on why Darth Sidious feared Qui-Gon more than any other Jedi. But while Qui-Gon Jinn was the greatest threat that the Republic could offer him, his fear of Dooku was driven for very different reasons. We do encourage you to check out our video on why Palpatine feared Qui-Gon though, but let's discuss why his fear for Dooku was so different than this. This fear first arose when the Clone Wars first began. After Darth Sidious ultimately caught word that Dooku was able to duel Master Yoda in Attack of the Clones to a standstill on Geonosis, while Dooku ultimately had to endanger the lives of Obi-Wan and Anakin in order to escape the wrath of the Grand Master, the duel was fairly even throughout the course of its duration, and there was no overtly clear victor. He was able to keep pace with the Grand Master of the Jedi Order despite crossing 80 years of age when this duel took place. And although Dooku did not outright defeat Yoda, this was still an incredibly formidable feat of power, one that Darth Sidious noted carefully. At the time, Sidious was considered to be the most powerful Sith Lord that had ever existed in Star Wars history, but he had yet to test his skills against Yoda in physical combat, or any Jedi of note for that matter. It wasn't until the Clone Wars commenced that he began dueling more regularly, defeating Savage Opress and Darth Maul on Mandalore, and facing off against Mace Windu and Yoda as the Clone Wars came to an inevitable close, just to name a few notable duels. In truth, Darth Sidious never believed that he would ever truly need his lightsaber all that much, and was far more focused on his gifts that could be attuned to him through the dark side, rather than skill with a blade. However, hearing that his apprentice was able to stand his ground against one of the best Jedi duelists of the era, and possibly in galactic history, was incredibly alarming to Sidious, and it caused him to reconsider his own abilities as a duelist and the very distinct possibility of Dooku overwhelming him with the blade. Many of the Jedi did not stand up to Sidious's prowess in lightsaber combat, but his true threat to the Jedi Order lay in his manipulation tactic meaning that he didn't need to be better than most Jedi in lightsaber combat, although he wanted to be. For the duration of the Clone Wars, Sidious did not need to fight Jedi in single combat simply because he had already manipulated the war to his liking. And even if Windu had killed him, he still would have eradicated most of the Jedi, rupturing to the brink of collapse regardless of whether or not Sidious lived or died. Dooku, however, stood in a very precarious position in regards to Sidious, as he was one of the only individuals to have direct contact with the Sith Lord, while still full well knowing that Palpatine was the Dark Lord of the the Sith, the Chancellor, and the creator of the war. This meant that now, in addition to political leverage, Dooku also had 
physical power over his master. Dooku, as the public face of the Separatist movement, had all the political influence that he needed over the Confederacy, commanding the droid army at will, and gaining the public support of these systems who followed him devoutly. Sidious, however, was not a public face of the Separatist movement, and his political influence was only applicable to the Republic, a Republic which he was about to crumble. As for the Separatists, Sidious could only speak through Dooku and had no direct power, meaning that his manipulation tactics wouldn't work on the Separatists without Dooku's assistance and being the voice. And furthermore, it meant that if Dooku ever decided to turn on Sidious, he would have to fall back on his prowess in lightsaber combat, something that he had always assumed would help him defeat his aging apprentices. Before the duel between Dooku and Yoda on Geonosis, Darth Sidious believed that he was the clear better of Dooku and Yoda at the same time, however he was more unsure about the Grand Master. This is why it was was so shocking for the Sith when Dooku met Yoda on even ground. While he knew that Dooku had once been a paragon of the Jedi Order and one of their most talented swordsmen, he also had reason to believe that Dooku could no longer achieve this height of his former glory in his age. After abandoning the ways of the Jedi to attend to matters on Sereno and learning the ways of the dark side combined with his advanced age, it stands to reason that Dooku's political power would be seen as more dangerous than his physical power. But now, Dooku had both. Sidious always believed that Dooku was a feared combatant and was more than capable to dispatch nearly any Jedi of the Order. Again though, Yoda was different. Upon discovering that he had nearly defeated Yoda, Sidious's entire worldview was brought into question, and Sidious was left to wonder whether or not he could actually defeat Dooku as easily as he had formally believed. This innate uncertainty was also augmented by the inclusion of Asajj Ventress to the battlefield, as Dooku took to training this gifted Sith assassin as his own. As the war waged on, Dooku and Ventress began to build a personal connection to one another, which soon began to resemble the very same relationship that he had once shared with Maul all those years ago. Contrary to popular belief, Darth Maul was actually taken under Sidious's wing while his own master, Darth Plagueis, was still alive. Under the guise that Maul would be used as a public assassin, and field operative, while the two true Sith Lords remained relegated to the shadows. Maul was expected to be a field agent in order to preserve the identities of Sidious and Plagueis, acting as a red herring for the Jedi Order, and a scapegoat if anything were to go wrong. However, Sidious's plan changed, and upon assassinating Darth Plagueis, he had the idea of promoting Maul to his formal Sith apprentice. However, this would never happen, as Darth Maul being cut in half by a Padawan Obi-Wan and Darth Plagueis's death were nearly at the same time. These same characteristics, though, began to surface with Dooku and Ventress, which was a clear red flag that Palpatine immediately recognized, and was the driving force behind his directive that Dooku should kill Ventress. By driving a wedge between them, he stalled Dooku from potentially overthrowing him until the war was over, though he still could not be certain. While we know that Sidious was a match for Yoda, and even won their duel in the Senate chambers, he still did not know this for certain until the time eventually arose for him to test his skills against the Jedi Grand master. He believed his talent to be equal to Yoda, if not better, but this was still strictly hypothetical following Dooku's duel with his former master. In fact, even though Sidious formally won the confrontation, in the Revenge of the Sith novelization, he had to put his lightsaber away in order to defeat Yoda, meaning that many of Sidious's fears were actually correct, and that Dooku may very well could have been the superior duelist to Sidious, and may have even gotten lucky. Dooku again was far too close to the plan of Darth Sidious, and when he saw that Dooku could meet Yoda on even ground, this struck him with intense fear. In the end though, what Sidious ultimately predicted would come true, and Dooku grew tired and weakened by the culmination of the Clone Wars, ultimately leaving the door open for Anakin Skywalker, the Chosen One, to defeat Dooku in single combat as he grew tired and weary. Something that many people fail to note about Dooku is that he is clearly far more powerful in Attack of the Clones than he is in Revenge of the Sith, as is dictated by the Revenge of the Sith novelization. And even Yoda senses this same change in his former apprentice in Dooku as the war wages on. As Anakin increases in power, Dooku decreases, and it is clear that Sidious's goals will still be maintained as he can now clearly overthrow Dooku in single combat. This doesn't change though the fear that he had for his apprentice for some time following the events of Attack of the Clones. But now my friends, I would love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this? 
What are your thoughts on Dooku and the fact that he met Yoda on even ground and that they very nearly met at a stalemate? Do you think that Darth Sidious would be able to overthrow Dooku if they ever came to blows? Or do you think that Sidious's fears against Dooku were very warranted? As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching the channel. Hit that subscribe button and may the force be with you. Darth Sidious is undoubtedly one of the most powerful Sith in history, with his command over the Force being his true calling card. Sidious was so powerful in fact that he had stated on one occasion that he believed himself to be above the use of a lightsaber, and that he merely used a lightsaber to mock the Jedi. However, there are many holes in Sidious's statement that would render this notion untrue. The fact that despite that he had mastered all seven forms of lightsaber combat, he still felt challenged by Dooku's skill and Dooku's own rising power. He had technically lost the duel with Master Yoda on Coruscant in the Senate Chamber, and he kept the second backup lightsaber. A lightsaber that he used at times when no Jedi were present, and chose to use a lightsaber against other Force wielders. If Sidious truly believed he was too powerful for a lightsaber, then these things would not have happened. This is what we wanted to open a discussion about today. We want to look at the facts and challenge Sidious's claim. It is no secret that we know of Sidious's opinions on lightsabers, which is that he doesn't really like them. The idea has been lightly explored in many different stories when Palpatine discusses the blades, with him outright stating that he judges the Sith's merit based on their power and knowledge of the dark side, and not their skill with a blade. It seems that Sidious strongly adhered to the idea that a lightsaber was truly a Jedi's weapon, and that the Sith had entirely grown beyond their use. Let's first discuss the holes in Sidious' statement, and why he is not more powerful than a lightsaber and beyond its use. Then we will discuss why he says this. Firstly, as stated before, if he had not cared much for lightsabers, then he might have chosen Nyman as his form of choice, and then went full into his power with the Force, opting for a more Exar Kun approach. However, he dedicated the time and study into mastering all seven forms of lightsaber combat and honing his body to be a living weapon. Something to note about Form 7 is it's something that acquires the mastery of all other lightsaber forms in order to use proficiently, meaning that Sidious dedicated a whole lot of time to his mastery of the blade for somebody that doesn't think that he needs it. Now of course, this can all be stated to simply be because he wanted to truly embody what it meant to be a culmination of all the past Sith by possessing their very skills. However, we know that Sidious never really intended in being in very many duels, as when his grand plan came to fruition, it would require very little saber-to-saber -saber combat and fighting at all. Despite this though, Sidious always kept a backup lightsaber, which meant that he was planning on a contingency plan in case he lost his own original one. Sidious wouldn't need such a contingency if he never planned on using his first lightsaber. I also want to call out Sidious's claim that he uses one merely to mock the Jedi. This, I do believe is true true, but not to the extent that Sidious claims. It is true that he made his lightsaber out of expensive metals, which essentially rendered it more as a piece of jewelry than anything else. This was a direct affront to the Jedi's humbler, more monk-like way of living. And Sidious wanted to counter this with an expensive and an elegant weapon, which goes against the very fundamentals of a Jedi. However, very few Jedi even ever saw Sidious's lightsaber, with only one ever living to tell the tale. The thing about it is, is that Sidious used his lightsaber more often when Jedi weren't present, such as when he dueled Maul and killed Savage Opress, and when he survived the ambush on Ryloth in the Lords of the Sith novel. Now of course we can argue aside that Sidious probably used his sabers with Maul and Savage to embarrass them as well, and show them how inferior they were to him, a true Sith Lord, mocking their reliance on their own lightsabers. But how does one explain what happened on Ryloth in the canon novel Lords of the Sith? In the novel, Vader and Sidious end up crash landing on Ryloth during a rebellion uprising, and the two Sith Lords have to survive many perils, and Palpatine actually uses his lightsaber not once, but three times during the whole book. The first was when he used it to help kill the resistance fighters that ambushed him as well as Vader. The second time was when he and Vader fell into a nest of large creatures, and they fought together to kill them using their lightsabers. And the third was when he actually was about to kill a little girl with his lightsaber before Darth Vader stopped him. If you ask me, these actions don't describe a man who doesn't seem to be too powerful for such a weapon, especially of course because no Jedi are ever present here. 
Even though he was a highly skilled duelist, able to contend with even the most masterful of combatants while treating it like playtime, he still lost the duel to Yoda on Coruscant in Blade to Blade. And when I say he lost the duel, I don't mean the battle entirely, which was more or less ended on a stalemate with Yoda having to retreat once the guard arrived. I mean, as far as lightsaber to lightsaber goes, Yoda technically won the duel as he had defeated Sidious on even ground, besting him at lightsaber combat and actually disarming the Sith Lord according to the novelization for Revenge of the Sith. After Yoda disarmed him, Sidious flew up to another senate pod, gaining the high ground and deciding to fall back on the area in which he was more skilled, that of course being the Force. Yoda and the Emperor engaged in a Force battle, however in this area, Sidious was the superior. So what can we gather from this duel and this information? I think a good conclusion to draw here is that although Sidious is very powerful with the Force, there are situations where a lightsaber is warranted, even in his his mind. I fully believe that the duel with Mace Windu and the Masters was an instance where he was mocking them, but in the duel with Yoda, he was disarmed and had to fall back on his force abilities, where of course he was more superior. However, just because he is more effective with just using the force doesn't mean he has become too powerful for a lightsaber. However, unlike the Sith Lords of old and even the Jedi, Sidious is not needlessly arrogant. He is proud, yes, like any Sith would be. However, he doesn't let his arrogance blind him or leave him open to weakness. So if he made a statement like this, there is a reason for it. I must admit there is something that I have been keeping from you this whole video that may actually prove the hidden meaning behind Sidious's claim. His bold statement comes from the novel Dark Lord The Rise of Darth Vader. His actual words were that the Sith had outgrown the need for lightsabers. His statement was not one of arrogance or self-indulgent pride, but simply a matter of fact. Let's explain. Sidious was not implying that he himself was too powerful for a lightsaber in the literal sense, but in his ideological sense. The Sith under the rule of two shed their cloaks of conquering through brute force and war. Conquering with a lightsaber was no longer the way of the Sith. Instead, they used cunning tact, superior intelligence, and always stayed one step ahead of their enemies. Sidious didn't win the war by cutting down droves of Jedi with his blade. Even the most powerful Sith Lords of the past, such as Nihilus, did that and still lost to the Jedi. No, the Sith had evolved and grown and had become so much more than a religious warrior group like the Jedi. They had become the very political lifeblood of the galaxy itself. This is what Palpatine meant by the Sith had outgrown the need for lightsabers. This is what he meant when he said he uses the lightsaber to mock the Jedi. Not in a literal manner, but in a way where he is essentially play fighting with them, even though the Jedi had already lost and had lost for many years prior. His Princess Leia Organa is one of the most powerful and most important characters in all of Star Wars lore. From an illustrious political career throughout the course of her life, from a diplomat to a trusted rebel leader and eventual cornerstone of the New Republic, she had no shortage of political experience. Leia's political career actually began when she was just a child, accompanying her adopted father, Bail Organa, on her adventures with the Imperial Senate and studying under for them for the duration of her early life. This meant that she was far more closely associated with the Empire than she arguably should have been at such a young age. As Bale served on the Imperial Senate and helped manage the daily affairs of the Empire while secretly nightlighting as a rebel leader, committed to destabilizing and dismantling the regime established by Sidious. On one particular occasion, however, Princess Leia actually came into direct contact with none other than the Emperor himself. Shared in a conversation about the Empire with Palpatine long before learning of the Death Star plans or even taking a leadership position in the Rebellion, with this marking the only time that Leia and Sidious communicated with one another. So today, weary acolytes and students of the Force, let's dive into this interaction and when Leia came face to face with Emperor Palpatine. This account of events as of now takes place in Legends continuity, but since there is nothing as of now to dispute that this happened in modern canon, it's reasonable to believe it May have also occurred in canon. From a very young age, Princess Leia came to quickly understand that the Empire was a force for evil under the control of this malevolent individual, and the beliefs were verified when she ventured to Coruscant for the very first time. As a member of the Imperial Senate, Bail Organa was invited to a banquet at the capital of the Empire in the year 3 BBY, and Leia insisted that she would join him. For context, this puts Leia at roughly 16 years old. 
Although he understood the risks of bringing Leia involved, Bail reluctantly agreed to bring his daughter, if she was accompanied by guards from Alderaan at all times. And since she had never displayed any Force-related sensitivity or abilities, he believed that she would be relatively safe from detection from Sidious. While on Coruscant, she was shocked immediately, as she quickly got an up-close and personal look at the xenophobic and racist practices of the Emperor as she entered the slums of the Imperial capital. Though she had been developed an early sense of empathy for those who had been oppressed by the Empire, knowing that the Empire ultimately had to be dismantled, this was her first, most personal look at the actual circumstances, and the circumstances under which non-human entities lived under the power of Sidious. This led to her developing a very early sense of contempt for the Emperor, and her aggressive nature meant that should she ever come face to face with him, she would be eager to berate him and this party offered her the prime opportunity to do so. She told her father that night that it was her intention to call out the wrongdoings and confront Palpatine about his methods, methods which harmed thousands across his territory, to which he adamantly asked her not to do so. Bail told Leia that Palpatine was dangerous and had power beyond Leia's comprehension. The reasoning he used was that he had to maintain Alderaan's public image, and Alderaan had long since been an avid supporter of the Imperial regime. Bale himself had painted himself as an Imperial sympathizer for the duration of his career, whilst orchestrating the rebellion from the shadows. If Leia confronted the Emperor, then Alderaan's loyalty would be brought into question, and Bale's connection with the Rebel Alliance would put both himself as well as his family in grave danger, not to mention the entire planet. Furthermore, Bale was fully aware of Leia's true parentage, and knew that she was incredibly Force-sensitive due to her bloodline, and he knew exactly what kind of risk he carried if she were to Ever be exposed. Leia at the time, though, had no idea of this latent ability, so it wasn't even a matter of having her hide it from these two incredibly powerful individuals, Insidious and Vader. In Star Wars Tales number 15, the comic issue that describes this event, Leia recalls this particular encounter and even comes to fully understand her father's apprehension against Palpatine. Leia states that she was surprised he even let her come in the first place, knowing how force sensitive she was and risking exposure to Vader and the Emperor. But since she hadn't decided displayed any latent force potential until that point, he must have believed that Leia was relatively safe. In her mind, Leia prepared her arguments and hyped herself up for the eventual encounter wherein she would be able to finally come face to face with the Emperor and confront him for his wrongdoing. When she finally came face to face with Palpatine, however, this confidence quickly melted away. As soon as she was within his presence, she was consumed by an eerie, uncomfortable feeling of immense darkness that stopped her dead in her tracks, which might have been her detecting his true aura through the Force itself or it might have been simply his imposing presence before her. Even the brave and headstrong Princess Leia, future leader of the Rebellion and fearless soldier, was petrified of Palpatine's mere presence. She describes him as being consumed in the darkness, and she believed him to be one of the single most evil individuals that she had ever encountered. In fact, she confirmed it. And all Palpatine did was smile at her as her aggression and arguments dissipated. Unable to speak beyond a small thank you, Palpatine admired her ferocious nature and stated that he looked forward to her joining the Imperial Senate one day, knowing of Leia's reputation. While Leia crumbled under the pressure, this led one of the most important moments in her life and one that would define the future of her involvement with the Rebellion. The emotion that Leia Organa was left with when she had this devastating encounter with the Emperor was simply that of fear. She had sensed something and felt something within the Emperor that she had never experienced before, and this was Leia Organa's truest brush with the dark side. It was following this though, and Leia being inconsolable, that Bail Organa revealed the truth, and revealed that there was an underground network of rebels working to overthrow Palpatine and his empire. Thus, Leia Organa took her first steps into the rebellion, and it was this moment with Darth Sidious, Emperor Palpatine that defined Leia as a rebel leader. She sensed the very dark side of the Force within the leader of the Imperial Senate, within the Emperor himself. In many ways, this served as a major awakening for Leia, as this is her first major brush with a Force wielder, if we're not counting the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. This is also her first experience with the dark side of the Force, and it's incredible that although Sidious was unable to sense Leia had any latent Force potential, that she could sense his so purely. As Sidious is quite famous for actually hiding his Force signature, that is why many of the Jedi did not detect him during the prequel era. However, 
with Leia Organa, whether or not Sidious has stopped hiding, or whether or not she is powerful enough to do so. It is clear that she does sense something dark within Palpatine, and something that shakes her to her core, but also grows to define her, and grows to her ultimately deciding that the Empire must fall. Although Leia crumbled in this single encounter as Palpatine walked past her, an old and decrepit man, she could sense his latent dark potential, and it was at this moment that Leia knew that Palpatine must be destroyed. But in Throughout the centuries of the Sith rule, during the post bainai era, the rule of two grew into perhaps the most important and most prevalent doctrine for all future Sith to follow, allowing only one master and one apprentice to rule the regime of the Sith at any given time, a master to hold the power and to covet it, and an apprentice to desire it above all else. As the years went on though, various Sith attempted to break the this sacred precedent or bend it to their own will, with some taking on dark side apprentices or Sith assassins to do their bidding, while most blatantly took on a new Sith Padawan before executing their masters and bringing the tradition full circle, some did not follow this doctrine. During the Age of the Empire, for instance, Darth Sidious and Darth Vader employed a legion of over a dozen sinister assassins known as the Legion of Imperial Inquisitors, tasked with hunting down any floundering Jedi survivors and executing any remaining trace of the old order that they could find. While these Inquisitors were not formally considered to be Sith in any traditional sense, they were innately strong dark side practitioners with affinities for lightsaber combat and a malicious disdain for the Jedi, making them pseudo-Sith by all logical definitions. However, Dark Jedi seems more accurate. Given the employment of these Inquisitors, however, and this major risk that Palpatine was undertaking by having them, why wasn't Palpatine fearful that Vader and the Inquisitors might seek to overthrow him? If Palpatine was offering all of these dark side adepts that would listen solely to Darth Vader, all of these potential apprentices at Vader's disposal, so why wasn't Sidious afraid at all? Less than two years earlier, Sidious had ordered Count Dooku to eliminate Asajj Ventress because he believed she posed a significant threat to his rule as a new Sith apprentice, and Sidious believed that she was in fact a viable prospect for a true secret apprentice. So then, why doesn't the same things apply for somebody like the Grand Inquisitor, who may have made the perfect apprentice for Darth Vader and a perfect candidate to one day become a true Sith? Well today, students of the Force and Acolytes of the Galaxy, let's explore a few of the reasons why Palpatine wasn't worried about Vader using the Inquisitors as his new apprentices, and why he believed that the Inquisitors, despite being powerful Jedi Butchers, were not a threat to his power whatsoever. The explanation is actually quite interesting. First, it's important to understand how Vader's relationship with the Inquisitors differs from something like Dooku's relationship with Ventress, or even Palpatine's own relationship with Maul, who Palpatine took as his apprentice even though he was still under an official apprenticeship by Lord Plagueis. Let's begin with talking about the relationship between Dooku and Ventress. Ventress had a very clear master and apprentice relationship, wherein Dooku offered her continual one-on-one -on -one training, teaching her more skills and augmenting her power in the dark side. He taught her the ways of the Sith and the abilities needed to be formally inducted into the Sith Order on a highly individualized curriculum. This was a personal connection that Palpatine feared above all else, as Dooku truly did like Ventress and admired her power, as they became to learn more about each other and developed an ability to work together effectively as master and apprentice. With these Inquisitors, however, their training was not only very limited, but was highly impersonal. They were trained in lightsaber combat and various dark side force abilities in order to specifically hunt Jedi, as this was their sole task. But after they had completed their initial initiation into the Inquisitor program, they were left to their own devices and sent their own ways with no further training whatsoever, because of the simple fact that Vader did not want to bother with them and he himself was obsessed with killing Jedi. It's also important to mention that since their training was stifled, none of them were any match for either Vader or Palpatine even altogether, nor were they receiving any further training on how to become stronger, and it's highly unlikely that Vader would even be able to take them under his wing in the first place. During the selection of the Inquisitors, this is something very important, as it seems as if Palpatine had to find a particular level of skill and innate force ability that he deemed acceptable. Not too weak to the point where they could not overcome Jedi, but not too powerful so they could ever be a threat to his rule. He had to scour his prospects in order to find Inquisitor candidates that were powerful enough to rival Jedi survivors, but not powerful enough to stand against himself nor Vader. And this meant that while the Inquisitors were lethal to survive, 
surviving Jedi, they were not nearly as dangerous to someone like the Chosen One or the Emperor of the Galactic Armada, and the culmination of the Rule of Two. We even see this quite clearly in the Kenobi series, when Reva finally chooses to confront Darth Vader. Reva, who is already a talented Force-sensitive and lightsaber combatant, has spent the duration of her life honing her skills. She is one of the most aggressive Inquisitors that we have ever seen, augmenting her strength within the dark side as she brutally hunts Obi-Wan and any other remaining Jedi, utilizing inherently violent methods to achieve her goal. She is a gifted lightsaber combatant and a ruthless fighter, yet when she confronts Vader, she is utterly humiliated by the Dark Lord despite her years of practice. One could argue that she is one of the most violent Inquisitors, and a case could be made that she is one of the most powerful, though likely still not the single most powerful Inquisitor to date. Yet, when it comes to Darth Vader, he is able to match her without ever even drawing upon his lightsaber. This is because Reva lies right in that sweet spot when pertaining to her power, and was inducted as an Inquisitor simply due to her inability to face Vader effectively. Here, she was dwarfed by the innate power that comes with being a Dark Lord, as the shadow of Vader's vengeance loomed over her. She is no match for a Sith, and has no official Sith training whatsoever. It's also important to note that Palpatine never had any reason to believe Vader had a personal one-on-one -on -one training session with any of these Inquisitors, as Vader was continually watched by Darth Sidious's royal guards. With this being a major reason as to why, Vader was seldom able to make a move without Sidious knowing about it and this stifled his ability to enact the rule of two in the first place, or take on a student of his own. If he had ever been shown to develop a personal relationship with an Inquisitor, which went beyond simply being professional collaborators, then Palpatine would have eventually found out, and this absolutely would raise his concern. Here, Palpatine would have acted as he did against Dooku, although this quite notably never happened. Since this never happened though, there was nothing for Palpatine to ever be concerned about in the first place, because the Inquisitors were not receiving any additional training or specific treatment from Vader. Many fans of Star Wars lore underestimates what it truly means to be trained as a fully formed Sith Lord, and the power difference between somebody like Maul and the Grand Inquisitor. The Grand Inquisitor is a skilled Jedi hunter, but he is nowhere near the level of a Sith assassin like Maul, who has formal Sith training, and therefore places him far beyond any Inquisitor, simply because of the training that he received under Sidious. As long as Palpatine kept his eye on Vader, he would be absolutely sure that he was safe and he would not be training any of the Inquisitors without Sidious knowing about this. Palpatine kept a long list of contingencies at the ready in case Vader ever decided to turn on him, and this is something that Vader knew about. Not to mention that none of the Inquisitors were naturally powerful enough to overthrow Sidious. And even if Darth Vader banded together with all of the Inquisitors, the Inquisitors could be turned against instantaneously, as Darth Sidious still had inherently within the clones the ability to enact Order 66. And it's likely that he would have told the clone troopers to enact Order 66 had the Inquisitors ever turned on him. Not to mention that Darth Vader himself is truly vulnerable to Sidious, from the vulnerabilities in his suit to the various Strandcast cloning projects he had operating in the shadows. Palpatine ensured that nobody could threaten his rule so long as he was able to keep Darth Vader in check, especially the Inquisitors. And this is why Darth Sidious never inherently feared the Inquisitors whatsoever. But anyway my friends, what do you think of this explanation? Do you think the Inquisitors ever stood a chance against challenging Palpatine's rule? And if so, which Inquisitor do you think would have been the best set the apprentice for Lord Vader? As always my friends, may the force be with you, and I hope that you have a great day. Hello Acolytes and welcome back to the channel. In the era of the prequel trilogy and the Clone Wars, there were countless what-if scenarios that could have completely changed the course of history as we know it. What if Anakin had been sent to Utapau instead of Obi-Wan to face General Grievous? What if Yoda personally didn't go to see the droid attack on the Wookiees and was present at the Jedi Temple during Order 66? And of course, even the smaller things, such as what if the Jedi had taken Dooku's warning to heart about there being a Sith Lord in the Senate just a little bit more seriously than they did? Every one of these things could have brought an end to the carefully laid out plans of Darth Sidious and brought it all to a swift and abrupt ending. One thing that has 
been brought to our attention is something that would actually seem rather obvious to do, and something that would have saved the Republic. The question is, why didn't the Jedi test Palpatine's blood for midichlorians? The midichlorians were an idea first introduced in The Phantom Menace to explain how living people connect to the mystical energy that is the Force. On Tatooine, Qui-Gon Jinn would test the young Anakin Skywalker's blood and send it in for analysis. Typically, the range for midichlorian counts for regular humans hovered somewhere between 2,500, with the average Jedi, Obi-Wan included, being somewhere around 13,000, which would prove that they were indeed Force-sensitive. Obi-Wan was astounded to find that Anakin's midichlorian count was obviously massive and paled in comparison to Obi-Wan's own, a midichlorian count even passing Grandmaster Yoda's, who clocks in at around 17,700 himself. Anakin's midichlorian count was the highest ever recorded, being somewhere between 28,000 to 30,000, and George Lucas even insinuating it could possibly be as high as 40,000, meaning theoretically he could have twice the force potential of Yoda. This is a great scale to keep in mind moving forward. Anyway, on Geonosis, Count Dooku revealed to a captured Obi-Wan that there was indeed a Sith Lord in the Senate, controlling the entire war from behind the scenes. Dooku was using this information as a sort of last-ditched plea to get Obi-Wan over to his side by basically laying out all of the Empire's secrets and plans right in front of him, hoping that Obi-Wan would become Dooku's apprentice. Unfortunately for Dooku, Obi-Wan denied this information, though he did end up reporting it to the Jedi High Council. Due to these leading factors, one would think that they would start testing all senators for Force sensitivity, beginning obviously with Palpatine. Mace Windu himself even said in Revenge of the Sith that the dark side surrounds the Chancellor, so why didn't they test Palpatine's blood for midichlorians? Well, Acolytes, we have the answer today, and a revelation that some Jedi did actually think of this plan. First though, according to our analytics, a lot of you guys that watch the channel haven't actually subscribed yet, so if you've been enjoying the content and want to stay up to date with everything Star Wars related, force crush that subscribe button. One simple answer is the Jedi's hubris. The Jedi were so arrogant that they couldn't possibly believe that any Sith Lord would be in the Council without them sensing it not knowing the underlying factors that were clouding their very vision. Many factors that worked directly in Palpatine's favor, the Jedi's pride, the war at hand, and the fact that the Jedi Temple is literally built right on top of a Sith shrine. Video on that on the horizon, and possibly even Palpatine using Sith artifacts in his office to corrupt the Jedi's insight. The other, more complex answer lies in the fact that the political climate of the Clone Wars at the time was very complicated to say the least. Senate debates were outright turbulent, and not all senators cared very much for the Jedi Order. A mandated blood test from the Jedi Council to the Senate would not only be met with controversy, but outright resistance and outrage. However, there were actually two Jedi that had thought this through, and thought about giving the Senators a blood test, deciding to go directly over the Council's head. However, the individual that they turned to proved to be a massive mistake, as they went directly to Palpatine for help. This master and his apprentice would explain everything to the Supreme Chancellor, and offer that perhaps if he performed a blood test, then everyone in the Senate would follow his suit, so that they could then narrow down the search for this elusive Sith Lord. It was true that this Jedi Master and Palpatine had actually been friends, or at least the Jedi Master believed that they had been friends, which is why he felt so confident going directly to Palpatine, who at the time actually had an exemplary relationship with the Jedi. Not to mention Palpatine's approval rate at the time was at an all-time high. Anyone who was someone that wanted to keep their political reputation intact were going to do as the Chancellor did. The problem the Jedi were running into was that they would need a warrant to mandate a mass blood test, and such a warrant could only come from the Supreme Chancellor. Knowing this, these two naive Jedi laid out everything before Palpatine, secretly of course Darth Sidious. Palpatine silently considered his options for a moment knowing that he couldn't possibly go through with the test. All this time, using every bit of his resources to keep the Jedi's vision clouded, furious that it could all crumble due to a simple blood test that would undoubtedly reveal his whopping 20,000 midichlorian count. A count completely passing Yoda and being second only to the Chosen One. Thinking quickly, Palpatine tactfully asked the two Jedi what Grandmaster Yoda thought of this experiment, and to their detriment, the two revealed that they hadn't told anyone of this plan, 
anyone but Lord Sidious. Palpatine encouraged them to keep it to themselves while he thought it over. After the Jedi left to tend to the battlefield on the planet of Mursan, Sidious contacted Dooku and instructed him to lead a full assault on the planet, killing both Jedi in the process. With their deaths, their plan died with them, and Palpatine's secret was safe. This sort of cunning was the same thing that Palpatine used to silence Five during the Clone Wars. It seems that tying up loose ends was something that this Dark Lord of the Sith was quite adept at. To answer the question in the beginning very plainly though, it was basically because of the political state of the galaxy as a whole. During the Clone Wars, the Jedi became warriors, and it was highly believed that the Jedi could actually take over the Republic. And it was because of this that there was much unease and distrust between the Senate and the Jedi at the time. The Jedi ordering the Senate to do something would have looked terrible on behalf of the Jedi, especially if it was a mandate, not to mention the means of requiring this mandate, again they would have had to go to the Senate, Chancellor Palpatine, who obviously was not going to let it happen. This would have been the first sign that the Jedi were in fact going to take over, and it's likely that many of the Senators would have outright refused, meaning just as Palpatine had planned, it was nearly impossible for them to test anybody's blood in the Senate because of the massive distrust between the two groups. But anyway, my friends, what did you think of this? Was this a topic and a question that you had wondered about before? And let us know what other topics you'd like to see explored in the comments down below. As what did Darth Sidious believe would happen if the fact that he was a Sith Lord was revealed to the entire Star Wars galaxy? Well today, we intend on answering that question with two very different answers. There was one major reason why Palpatine was not in fact worried of the fact that him being a Sith Lord would be revealed to the galaxy, as he believed that the ramifications could actually be positive and work in his favor. However, there was another facet of Palpatine that believed that the fact that he was a Sith Lord could be highly detrimental to his rise and continued power. And this is a reason that you may not expect. So today, students of the Force and acolytes of the galaxy, let's delve into it. Our story begins a thousand years before Darth Sidious. Darth Bane mandated that all Sith should keep their allegiance to the Order a secret. This is due to the reputation that the Sith had made for themselves throughout their entirety of Star Wars history being conquerors and dealers of death. The Sith had a terrible reputation of constantly attempting to overthrow the Republic, and at the same time constantly being thwarted by the Republic and the Jedi. And it is for this major reason that Darth Bane believed that the reputation of the Sith was too toxic to keep intact, at least of course publicly. And it is because of this that Darth Bane mandated that the Sith should remain in the shadow, and no individual should openly carry their allegiance to the Sith, and this would prove bad for the Order. The Jedi for generations had promoted the fact that the Sith needed to be destroyed, as the Sith were portrayed as the greatest enemy of the galaxy and the Jedi its greatest hero, which is why it was so crucial for the Sith to remain hidden. This was actually a new addition added by Darth Bane, as before this, the Sith title was wielded quite openly, and Sith were proud of the fact that they were in fact dark side aligned. But Darth Bane changed this entirely along with implementing the rule of two. This began a great era of secrecy for the Sith, where it was important to believe that they were utterly destroyed during the previous war, and that the previous era of Sith was no more, and that the Sith were completely wiped from the star maps, allowing the Sith to not only move from the literal shadows, but the shadows of the galaxy in plain sight. From the shadows is where they would formulate their master plan and would not be targeted purely based on their beliefs and doctrine as a Sith Lord, as well as be placed upon the past transgressions of the Order and the galaxy. As Darth Bane considered this to be a huge drawback, for the Sith and therefore attempted to do away from it, something that was quite brilliant. And without this, it would have been quite difficult for the current generation and Sidious and Vader to rise to such prominence. Based off of what we know, Palpatine also followed this strict doctrine by the fact that no one publicly knew that he was in fact a Sith Lord, or at least those that did were very very close to him and select. It's even more telling that Darth Sidious kept this intact after his rise as Emperor, as even after he became the Emperor of the entire galaxy. Galaxy, very few individuals knew the fact that he was in fact a Sith Lord. The very few that did had either been outright told or had deduced it themselves, such as Thrawn or Tarkin. In the end though, Palpatine came to a conclusion of his own separate from that of Darth Bane, and in a rare occasion, he actually disagreed with the philosophy of Bane, and believed that if he 
so desired to, he could reveal to the larger galaxy that he was in fact a Sith. And this is why Palpatine's reasoning as to why he was not ousted as a Sith Lord during the Imperial era was much different than what Darth Bane mandated. Although he did follow this doctrine as set in place before he became the Emperor, he believed it was ultimately important to keep his true identity hidden. In a canon novel though, Darth Sidious explicitly states that he is not afraid of the galaxy knowing that Darth Vader was in fact a Sith Lord, but he does not mention or go into detail about himself being out as a Sith Lord. Darth Vader was of course the second in command when it came to the military of the Empire, and again, Darth Sidious was not shy at the fact that Vader was a Sith Lord. This is the major reason why again Tarkin and Thrawn were able to deduce that Sidious himself was a Sith Lord, as they were aware of prior Sith doctrine. So by this information, it's clear that this isn't something that Darth Sidious was holding close to the belt any longer. Palpatine now believed that the truth of his identity could be used as a weapon in his own favor in fact, where previously it would have destroyed him. As now, there was no massive force in the Jedi to oppose Sidious after he became the Emperor. It is because of this fact that Sidious believed that the knowledge that he was a Sith Lord could be used to cause fear throughout the galaxy for the Empire and their Emperor directly. A sense of fear that was not present during the Republic era. Sidious could use this to his great advantage, as he ruled mainly out of fear of his regime when he ultimately came to power. As the Empire was able to gain power through the mistrust of the Jedi, but they maintained power through fear and brute strength. Therefore, Palpatine deemed these two traits to be invaluable. And even if there were rumors that Emperor Palpatine may in fact be a Sith Lord, Darth Sidious did not deem these ideas too detrimental to his reign. However, this is not to say that Palpatine had no concerns of the galaxy discovering that he was in fact a Sith Lord, as there was one specific, very surprising problem that Palpatine had. And it may not be exactly what you think. In Sidious' own writings, he revealed that he did such a great job turning the galaxy against the Jedi, that the galaxy now feared all Force sensitives outright. This is due to their incredible ability to touch the Force of course, which makes them more powerful by a huge margin compared to a normal individual. Not to mention that the average individual of the galaxy knows very little of the Force, let alone the orders that wield it. Darth Sidious in his own campaign literally indoctrinated the entire public to believe that all Force sensitives were evil, and wanted to obtain as much power as possible. Possible, with Palpatine arising as the true, average, everyday man hero of the Clone War, with the Jedi being portrayed as the power-hungry villains. And it was this connection with the Jedi Order, in the very fact that both the Sith and the Jedi used the Force, that Palpatine feared more than any connection that he had with the Sith. It was in fact his fear of the Jedi and the connection of the Sith and Jedi's interlocked connection that Darth Sidious feared more than any ancient Sith lore or doctrine. He realized that the galaxy did not understand the Force, and therefore, they did not understand the Sith or the Jedi. Darth Sidious toppled an entire governing system because of the simple fact that they were afraid of Force wielders, targeting the Jedi specifically. But Sidious realized that he too, as a Sith Lord and a Force sensitive in general, was also at risk. Darth Sidious realized that he garnered much favor throughout the galaxy because of the fact that he posed himself as someone that could not touch the gifts of the Force, and was not a aligned with the Jedi whatsoever, and this is why he became a great hero over the course of the Clone Wars as the more common man and common man representative in the Senate, and in the Republic as well, a place where the Jedi held much esteem and power. This made him more relatable, and is the exact reason why he rose to power without the gifts of the Force to the public, as they so swiftly and readily trusted him completely. Sidious knew that if the galaxy came to understand that he was in fact a Sith Lord, that everything that he had established prior of his own reputation would come into question. He now knew that if the galaxy was still governed by a force wielder, that they would grow to oppose him even more strongly simply because of the sins of the Jedi. Because again, the fact that the previous generation was sick of being governed by force wielders in the Jedi Order, and believed that they were all power hungry savages that planned to overthrow the more common man in the Republic. The ironic thing about Palpatine is that he believed the galaxy would turn on him not because of the transgressions of the Sith, although they were numerous, but because of the transgressions of the Jedi in the previous era, transgressions that Darth Sidious helped to uphold. This is an aspect of Star Wars lore that I found exceedingly interesting, as it is the simple fact that the galaxy overall hated force wielders that Darth Sidious was so afraid to be revealed as a Sith Lord 
not due to the millions of people that the Sith have killed. But anyway, my friends, now I turn it over to you. What are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on Darth Sidious and his opinions on what he believed would happen if he was revealed to be a Dark Lord? If you're enjoying this daily Star Wars lore, reach out with the Force and Force Crush that subscribe button. The master and apprentice relationship between Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis is among some of the most unique in the entire history of the Sith. Darth Plagueis did not originally intend to take upon himself an apprentice, believing that he was the culmination of the Sith rule of two, and that he, in Plagueis, would be the one to finally bring the plan established by Darth Bane to the galaxy, destroying the Jedi and becoming the Emperor. It wasn't until Darth Plagueis ventured to the world of Naboo and sensed something peculiar within the Force that he resolved to take on a brand new apprentice. Darth Plagueis though did not believe that he needed an apprentice, but Sidious and his natural power, at the time named Palpatine, was simply too much to ignore. What fascinated Darth Plagueis about Palpatine was his innate ability to hide himself in the Force despite being massively powerful. The most powerful individual that Darth Plagueis had ever sensed in the Force once Darth Sidious revealed himself. Plagueis was amazed that a boy with no formal training in the dark side had achieved such a naturally difficult ability, and with this, desired to rule with Darth Sidious at his side as co-emperors of the galaxy, believing the presence of Sidious to be a gift from the dark side itself and the culmination of the Rule of Two. With Plagueis believe it was fitting that the Rule of Two should end with two Sith Emperors. With this though, this is not to say that once Darth Plagueis began training Sidious that he did not have problems with his Sith Apprentice. One issue that Darth Plagueis themed his greatest pitfall in the Force and the Mac nations of the dark side in general. And today, students of the Force and acolytes of the galaxy, we will explain just that, and explain exactly why Darth Plagueis was afraid that Darth Sidious' fascination with the ancient Sith would ultimately lead him to be defeated by the Jedi. To put things lightly, Darth Plagueis was not a big fan of the ancient Sith Lords at all, nor their doctrine. He believed that although there was great power and potential in the teachings of the ancient Sith and the Sith that originated in the Star Wars universe, that the Sith had to evolve, with Darth Plagueis taking this evolution established by Bane very seriously, as Darth Plagueis knew that the ancient Sith had never conquered the galaxy, and therefore believed that the teachings that he himself would create in his studies with the midichlorians and the Force itself were far more advantageous than anything that the Old Masters could offer. Although the Old Masters may have been more gifted in combat, despite all of their prowess, again, they had never defeated the Jedi, never conquered the Republic, and never reigned supreme. This is exactly why Darth Plagueis was so concerned when his apprentice Insidious showed a great fascination with the machinations of the ancient Sith Lords. To Plagueis' own admittance, the ancient Sith Lords were more gifted combatants, but this in essence went against what Darth Bane was attempting to establish and what Plagueis and his master before him had discovered. That being that the Sith did in fact need to change, and that the Sith would never be able to seize the galaxy simply by superior strength and arm. This is why Higo Damask, who was in fact Darth Plagueis, was a highly influential political figure in the galaxy, being the head of the banking clan, and Darth Sidious and Palpatine having huge political power as well. Being born into the noble house of Palpatine, and with ambitions of becoming the Supreme Chancellor. These were the methods in which the Sith would ultimately conquer, and therefore when Darth Sidious so huge interest in discovering the Force abilities and the histories of the ancient Sith Lord, Darth Plagueis ultimately denied him of this knowledge. Darth Sidious had a huge desire to venture to the ancient Sith worlds of Korriban and Zayo. Sidious wanted to explore the ancient tombs of these masters in search of knowledge and their histories, but this is something that Darth Plagueis ultimately banned Sidious from doing. And unlike many Sith Lords, Darth Sidious actually obeyed his master. Plagueis believed that Darth Sidious needed to focus on creating his own path in the dark side of the Force and not be influenced by the ancient Sith Lord that had come before him and had ultimately failed. Sidious believed that if he were to ever conquer the incredible might of Darth Plagueis though, he needed this information, not realizing that his master, unlike many Sith Lords, were not withholding this information to make Darth Sidious weaker, but to ensure that he culminated into the perfect Sith before being allowed to delve deeper into this greater knowledge. Darth Plagueis believed that Sidious was becoming far too impatient and that hidden deep within the tombs of the Old Masters would be great power in the dark side of the Force, but not the power that the Sith needed. Again, the Ancient Masters were hugely destructive in their abilities to touch the Force. They were better fighters 
worse than many of the Rule of Two era Sith. But Darth Plagueis knew that if Sidious got too caught up in all of this, he would fail to be taught in the more obscure abilities of the dark side that they needed, such as focusing more on his own force concealment and gaining political power and intrigue. The ancient Sith focused little on midichlorians, which Darth Plagueis was admittedly obsessed by, as Plagueis believed that the secret to eternal life did not lay in the tombs of the old masters, but within his own mind, and he believed that with the help of Sidious, they could create new trails in the dark side that had never been walked before. Luckily for Darth Sidious, he did actually follow all of these teachings by Darth Plagueis to a T, with the exception of a single time. When Darth Sidious ventured to the world of Dathomir and eventually discovered the young Zabrak male known as Maul, taking him as his apprentice. But again, Darth Sidious obeyed the greater wishes of Darth Plagueis and did not venture to worlds such as Korriban, until of course, Darth Plagueis was ultimately killed. Following the death of Darth Plagueis, Darth Sidious did actually venture to these worlds, but he would not be corrupted by the knowledge held within in the Old Masters. Instead, what Darth Plagueis wanted ultimately did occur, as Darth Sidious had created his own path in the dark side and was his own unique Sith and simply used the teachings of the ancient Sith to amplify his knowledge and powers. But they were not the foundation in which that he was constructed. Darth Plagueis had huge faith in Darth Sidious, but he feared that he was overly ambitious and highly impatient believing that if he looked at the old knowledge first, then he would become more akin to the ancient Sith and more like a Sith warrior rather than a true Sith Emperor. What is very unique about Darth Plagueis is he never intended to withhold any true knowledge from Darth Sidious, which is something that many would consider his greatest fatal mistake. Darth Plagueis desired to share all of his knowledge with Darth Sidious and for the two of them to reign as equals, which in a sense does go against the doctrine of the Rule of Two. Darth Sidious, however, staunchly held to the Rule of to, believing that one day he would in fact kill Plagueis. The downfall of Plagueis though is that he simply trusted Sidious far too much and any knowledge that he decided to withhold from Sidious was actually for the betterment of the young Sith Lord. But anyway my friends and students of the Force, what are your thoughts on this insight and the fact that Darth Plagueis did not want his apprentice and Sidious to study the powers, machinations, and scripts of the ancient lords who had failed to conquer the Republic, at least until Sidious had established his own laws in the the dark side and his own creations. Do you believe that this was a major contributing factor into Sidious's great power and his eventual rise like we do here at the channel? As always my friends, thank you guys so much for watching and continuing to support. May the force be with you and I will hopefully see you in a later video. Welcome back students of the force to the channel. When Darth Sidious was made Emperor of the Galaxy in the year 19 BBY, he made it a point to keep his identities a Sith Lord secret, even despite him having won against the Jedi. Even though now he could widely practice his religion without being persecuted by the Jedi, he decided wisely to keep it hidden. After all, he had been doing it his whole life, so why not continue to keep the secret deep within himself? The reasons are actually pretty simply and honestly rather than genius. Sidious had spent his whole life campaigning as the Emperor in the early days, denouncing the Jedi Order and saying that their religious extremists shouldn't be allowed to dictate political affairs. So then what would it look like if he outed himself as a Force user as well? Palpatine actually directly comments on this in a full book, in his chapter in the Book of the Sith. The galaxy is free of Jedi, and the citizens rejoice. Therefore, it would be foolish to replace their regime with an identical system led by that of the Sith, at least publicly. The weak do not understand the Force. They venerate those who appear to be ordinary people like themselves. They cheered at the news that a resolute old man had survived a Jedi assassination attempt. In Palpatine, an ordinary senator from Naboo, they see a model of human achievement that rivals that of the Jedi. He goes on to say that simply carrying out the will of the dark side through Vader and other agents is enough to scare the citizens in line, and it was needless to reveal that a Sith had constructed the entire empire until it was was too late. However, despite his secrecy, there were a few individuals in the Empire who still knew or at least figured out that Sidious was a Sith Lord. Though it is a small handful of people, we can't help but wonder who all knew of Palpatine's true identity as Sidious. For this list, we will be excluding the obvious, that being Obi-Wan, Yoda, Vader, Maul, Ahsoka, and the crew of the Ghost. So now, without further ado, let us begin and explain who all knew that Darth Sidious was in fact the true Emperor of the Galaxy. 
We will start with one that we have actually covered before, which is why two royal guards that had accompanied Darth Vader and Sidious when they crash landed on the world of Ryloth in the novel Lords of the Sith knew that Palpatine was a Sith. One of these royal guards had actually been a clone from the Grand Army of the Republic, who had risen in the ranks and in favor of Sidious, and became the captain of his royal guard. For more information on him though, be sure to check out our video on the clone that Palpatine actually cared about. Anyway, both of these royal guards actually witnessed Palpatine used the Force and even saw him draw upon his lightsaber. In the book, the four of them are ambushed by Ryloth freedom fighters, when deep in the jungle, and they were all forced to defend themselves. Although only a single royal guard was needed to turn the tides of entire battles, and not to mention Lord Vader was among them, there were simply too many in the ambush for one to be doing their part. Not to mention, Palpatine didn't plan on leaving any survivors anyway. So witnessing this wasn't a problem using his force lightning and actually drawing upon his blade. He, Vader, and the two guards fought and slew every single one of the attackers. The royal guards were trusted enough by Sidious that they wouldn't say anything not even to one another. Therefore, it is implied that many of the Red Royal Guards knew that Palpatine was in fact a Sith Lord. Next up is Masa Meda. As Vice Chancellor of the Republic, it was Masa Meda that was a highly loyal underling to Darth Sidious, and would often be his cover when Sidious had to go do Sith Lord business. Ameda retained his power whenever the Republic transitioned to the Empire, serving as the Grand Vizier in the Imperial Ruling Council. After the Emperor was killed in 4 ABY, Masa Meda essentially took up as the ruling figurehead of the Imperial Remnants, but was not exactly up to par when it came to ruling the Empire as Palpatine had been. Following the final War of the Rebellion on Jakku in 5 ABY, Masa Meda surrendered the Empire to the New Republic by signing the Galactic Concordance. The Imperial government on Coruscant was replaced by a powerless provisional government with Masa Meda as its nominal leader. Alongside his political leaders that also knew of Darth Sidious's true identity was Sly Moore, who was the bald, white-skinned Unvarian female that was often seen accompanying Palpatine in his entourage. Sly Moore was actually Force-sensitive herself, and not only that, but was an adept as well. She would actually use her power to manipulate the masses in the Senate Hall whenever Palpatine gave his speeches. Alongside Masa Meda, she also helped keep Sidious's cover story whenever he had to lead into his double life during the Clone Wars. During the reign of the Empire, Sly Moore had actually been conspired against Vader, planning to kill him as she claimed that she was loyal only to the Emperor and not to Darth Vader and did not trust him. Though she was thwarted by Vader and found out after she attempted to assassinate him, it wasn't known what happened to her afterward, but no record of her death has ever been found. Unsurprisingly, other individuals that knew were Thrawn and Tarkin. Tarkin himself actually never received a confirmation, as he simply deduced it around that time, as he also deduced that Darth Vader was Anakin Skywalker. Though Thrawn was wise, and kept his assumptions to himself, and never told another soul, Thrawn knew of Sidious as the Emperor, and had actively spoken to Vader and Thrawn about his visions, which can be found in the novel Thrawn Ascendancy. It is unknown if all of the Imperial advisors actually knew of Sidious's secret and its true identity though, but we know for sure that one of them did. A group that is not often talked about, the Royal Advisors, were a group of Ultraman who wore Naboo fashion and can be seen in the background of the Emperor's Chambers on the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi. These men actually held a great margin of political power and were in charge of governors and appointing moths. However, despite their titles, they never actually advised Sidious on anything whatsoever, and he made sure to remind them that he was the one in control. Sidious needed no counsel other than his own. We do not know if any of all of the survivors knew of the Emperor's true secret, but we do know again that one did. This advisor's name was Yupei Tashu, who was actually a dark side scholar and a Sith cultist, though he did not have the power of the Force himself. That actually concludes our list. What's surprising about this is exactly how few people actually knew that Palpatine was in fact a Sith Lord, as it's roughly the same amount of people that knew that Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker were one and the same. This is a very, very well-kept secret within even the ranks of the Empire, and this is something that was exceedingly well-kept. Others have speculated, such as Mon Mothma and Bail Organa, knowing that Sidious was in fact a Dark Lord, with Bail
Gale perhaps hearing it from either Yoda or Obi-Wan, and Mon Mothma perhaps hearing it from the crew of the Ghost. Though we can't say for sure, as the Rebel Alliance was most likely in the dark about this information. But what do you think, friends? Our Emperor Sheev Palpatine is one of the most powerful Sith Lords in galactic history, and is arguably one of the most powerful individuals in all of the Skywalker lore. Not only is he an incredibly powerful Force user and lightsaber combatant, but he is an incredibly influential political figure who has the ability to bend entire governments to his will. Needless to say, there is not a lot that Palpatine feared. He is a cunning tactician and master strategist, in addition to one of the most talented Sith alchemists of his day, talented in the Sith practices of both old as well as new, offering Palpatine a wide variety of different skills and abilities, both in the Force and otherwise. It stands to reason that there would be very little that could possibly stand in Palpatine's way, as he was able to defeat the likes of Yoda and several talented Jedi Masters. The only known individual to best him in single combat had been killed, and his new empire was the most formidable governmental system in the galaxy. So, with all the power at the height of the Empire, was Palpatine afraid of really anything else? With the Jedi defeated and the Republic in shambles and now completely his, what could he possibly have to fear? Well today, students of the Force, let's answer that question and talk about some of the very few things that Palpatine actually feared over his political career as well as his career as a Sith Lord. Starting with the era of the Clone Wars and up until his death, we will talk about the very few individuals that Palpatine actually feared. In addition to this video, we recently released another video on how Palpatine feared Qui-Gon Jinn more than any other Jedi, which we encourage you to watch, as again, Jinn was actually feared by Sidious. But today, we will be talking about other individuals from across the lore. In terms of sheer power and raw strength, there was one particular individual that Palpatine feared during the era of the Republic, and that was the Dathomirian shaman and powerful force witch, Mother Talzin, and her coven of Night Sisters. Her leadership of the Night Sisters and power within the Force led her to governing one of the most powerful legions of Force sensitives in the entire galaxy during the Clone Wars era. Rivaling the power of the Jedi and Sith to some smaller degree, she was able to influence the flora and fauna of her homeworld of Dathomir and use the Force to influence the growth of plant life. Mastering this and other Force powers from the light and dark sides of the Force respectively in tandem, which is something that Sidious actually feared. Mother Talzin trained with the likes of both Darth Maul and Asajj Ventress before they were eventually turned over to the Sith, and she even traded dark side teachings with Sidious himself as an equal during his reign as a Dark Lord of the Sith. They fed off of one another and overlapping considerably as representatives of their own alliances, leading them both to seeing a similar terms of power and near equal force potential and control, at least at the time, as Palpatine is nowhere near as powerful during the Clone Wars era especially during the middle of it, than he would be following. As the Night Sisters were ultimately enlisted as assassins, their notoriety continued to grow throughout the duration of the Clone War, and they were some of the most gifted Force practitioners in the entire galaxy that didn't fall under the affiliation of the Jedi or other Dark Side Orders. If there was one individual outside of the Jedi Order that stood a chance of rivaling Palpatine's raw strength and straight Force potential, then it was likely Mother Talzin. Mother Talzin, of course, though, would be killed in 19 BBY by Ventress and later by Sidious himself, and her legion of Night Sisters was still regarded as one of the most powerful cults in galactic history. During the shadow of the Empire, however, Mother Talzin had been killed and the Night Sisters had been all but scattered, meaning that she didn't hold any threat to Palpatine whatsoever during the Imperial Era. So then, who was Palpatine's greatest threat at the height of the Empire? We know that the Rebellion was struggling to gain traction, Luke Skywalker was still largely unknown, and the limits of his power had not yet been tested. So who stood as the greatest threat to Palpatine's rule before his supposed death during the Battle of Endor? And who posed the greatest threat afterwards? Perhaps his greatest fear during the reign of the Empire was one of the individuals he was closest with in the entire galaxy, that being Darth Vader himself, who Palpatine had feared from the very beginning. During the era of the Clone Wars, Palpatine understood that much of his plan relied on turning Anakin to the dark side, and corrupting the Chosen One was no easy feat to accomplish, especially beneath the watch of the Jedi Order. 
which ran the risk of him being constantly discovered. Still though, he needed Anakin as his prize. He understood Anakin's full potential and the level to which he could one day grow. And before his defeat on Mustafar, Palpatine simultaneously feared and admired Anakin's latent potential and the fullest extent of what he may one day be capable of as a Sith. This meant that after his dismemberment at the hands of Obi-Wan, Palpatine had to enact certain safeguards in order to ensure that Vader still consistently was kept at bay and consistently kept under Sidious's own latent ability. Even after Vader had undergone these intense injuries, he was still a threat, even if Palpatine wanted him to believe that he was no longer one. Palpatine made Vader's suit particularly susceptible to force lightning, which would short out the life support circuits and kill Vader if he ever needed to resort to this, and he ensured that Vader would never be able to surpass him in power. Not only was he incredibly strong in the force, but now Palpatine had to keep him alive long enough to find a new apprentice, which was his ultimate goal. And Sidious no longer was content with being killed by Lord Vader, which added a new layer of fear and apprehension to his plans. Originally, Palpatine understood that Vader would eventually overthrow him and carry on the ways of the Sith under the doctrine of the Rule of Two established by Darth Bane, a rule that had gotten the Sith so far. And if Palpatine was able to still train the single greatest Sith Lord in the history of the galaxy, then he would be willing to accept his inevitable demise if his plans to achieve immortality did not work. Since Vader lost the extent of his potential, however, Sidious had to seek out other apprentices or ensure that his eternal life program worked in preserving his consciousness past a potential death. For the next 19 years, he had been on a constant guard against Vader always anticipating that he could be usurped from his position as Emperor, and he had to enact several different Imperial safeguards as well, including one that would effectively burn the structure of the Empire to the ground if he was ever to be killed. Eventually, Sidious was willing to let Vader die at the hands of Luke, who he believed could be a much stronger apprentice since he had not been crippled in the same way that Vader had. There is even an argument to be made that he came to fear Luke after his supposed death, but this is yet to be formally confirmed in the canon. However, it is likely that he did fear Luke to some extent based on his return in the end of the Skywalker saga, and the fact that Sidious had not been seen for the greater part of 35 years since the Battle of Endor, allowing Luke to grow disillusioned with the Jedi himself. Many believe that this is because he inherently feared Luke, and he refused to return until he could absolutely be sure that Luke was dead. What we can confirm, though, is Palpatine's inherent fear for Vader. Even though Vader was latently not as powerful as Sidious was in the Force, and had far less skill, he was still afraid of him, as after all, this was still the famed Chosen One of the Jedi. And Vader in his own right grew to a terrifying combatant, and all the fear that Vader imposed against his enemies, the Jedi, and rebels alike rubbed off on Sidious, the Emperor himself. But what are your thoughts on this, and what are your thoughts on the fact that these are the two individuals that Palpatine feared more than anybody else? Them, and of course Qui-Gon Jinn. And which of the three do you believe that he ultimately feared the most? As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching the channel. Hit that subscribe button, and may the Force be with you. The Dark Lords of the Sith Darth Nihilus and Darth Sidious belonged to two totally different eras in Star Wars. However, they held a deep connection and similarity to one another. In terms of command over raw force energy, Darth Nihilus and Darth Sidious are extremely similar, with their only equals perhaps again in raw force energy being the Knight Revan and the Chosen One Anakin Skywalker. But there is an even stranger connection between Nihilus and Sidious despite their raw potential in the darkness a connection that was only highlighted during their deaths. If we remember back to Return of the Jedi, after Darth Vader throws Darth Sidious down the reactor shaft, we see a gigantic explosion of blue energy. This phenomena in the Star Wars universe being something that is known as a dark side burst, something that is only achieved through extremely, extremely powerful dark side wielders and Sith Lords, but most notably with those Sith Lords that have a huge amount of uncontained and uncontrolled dark side energies within their bodies. Thus why someone like Dooku, who vastly controlled his dark side power, did not display this phenomena following his death. A dark side burst was described as, quote, a burst of dark side energy occasionally occurred when a powerful Sith or dark Jedi was killed. The resulting shockwave was sometimes very powerful, 
other times it was a simple dissolving of physical matter. In the case of Darth Sidious, this dark side burst was extremely impressive. At the point of his death, all of this raw dark side energy resulted in a gigantic explosion, the explosion that we witnessed at the end of Return of the Jedi. Sidious, though, was not the first one to display this explosion-like phenomena. The first one that we know about in Star Wars Mythos was Darth Nihilus. However, Nihilus's was very different. When Darth Nihilus was defeated by Mitra Surik, he was consumed by a small burst of scarlet energy, not blue energy. But with their death, something peculiar occurred within the Force itself, as the dark side seemed to linger longer and more powerful, but only for a moment. In the case of Darth Sidious's death, though, this lingering dark side energy was permanent, as the planet of Endor actually became a dark side nexus solely because Darth Sidious was killed there. Again though, because of this unchecked dark side rage within Sidious and Nihilus, both of them somewhat displayed this phenomena. I would briefly like to explain what I mean by raw dark side energy. As I briefly mentioned earlier, someone like Dooku vastly controlled his powers in the dark side of the force and himself overall. Darth Vader was also an example of someone who had great power but still learned to control that power. On the other hand, a character such as Starkiller is someone else with raw intense dark side energies within their body, energy left unchecked. And upon Starkiller or Galen Merrick's death, he also displayed something similar, but that's a topic for another video. Anyway guys, what are your thoughts on this connection between Darth Sidious and Darth Nihilus, and how both Sith Lords, extremely rarely I may add, both displayed this phenomena upon their death? Thank you guys so much for watching, may the force be with you, and have a great day. Dark Lord of the Sith for over four decades and Emperor of the Galactic Empire Palpatine is an individual who requires no introduction inside or outside of the Star Wars universe. He is one of, if not the most powerful Sith Lord who has ever lived. Palpatine's cunning and command over the dark side of the Force has brought millions to their knees, as well as their feet, as they cheered at his mighty power and influence. But naturally, when one is shrouded by great darkness, many facts about them are lesser known, and today we will count down 10 crazy facts about Palpatine. Number 10. He was born and raised on Naboo, the same planet we see in The Phantom Menace, and the same planet both Padme Amidala and Jar Jar Binks originate. Palpatine was born to a wealthy and powerful household. That being said, although among the most influential members of Naboo, they were far from the most powerful. At a young age, Palpatine implored his father to become involved in politics, reaching for power even before claiming the title of Sith Lord. Because his family initially refused his wishes, Palpatine grew to despise them, particularly his father, who he deemed weak. Number 9. He doesn't believe the Sith should require lightsabers, and sees himself as above them. Although Palpatine uses, and has several lightsabers in his possession, according to him, he only continues to use the weapon as an insult to the Jedi. Showing the Jedi he is superior with the weapon, despite the fact that he doesn't even need it. To put it simply, Palpatine believes his force abilities are more than enough to handle any opponent. After his rise as Emperor, and Jedi became a more rare occurrence in the galaxy, Palpatine began using the weapon less and less, although he always had at least one on him at all times. Despite his views on the weapon, his lightsabers were constructed using the finest materials and outfitted with an Electrum Trim, a rare metal used in jewelry in the Star Wars universe. And although it was not his favorite pastime, Palpatine grew to be a master duelist. Number 8. In Legends continuity, Palpatine never planned on being overthrown, or even dying. After his apparent death over Endor, it was revealed years later the spirit of Palpatine discovered how to return from the dead. It was also revealed for decades Palpatine had amassed an army of clones of himself so that he could possess them and essentially rule the galaxy forever. Although originally, Vader was intended to one day overthrow him and the rule of two continue, after his injuries on Mustafar, Palpatine determined he would never be powerful enough to destroy him. Number 7. Palpatine may have inadvertently created Anakin with his master Plagueis. While Palpatine was off rising through the ranks of the Senate, his master Plagueis was desperately trying to learn how to create life, in an attempt to live forever. Plagueis eventually achieved this through manipulating the midichlorians. When Palpatine met with his master, he had grown weary of his obsession with life and death, but was silenced when he witnessed Plagueis actually bring someone back from the dead. Together, the two Sith then began a ritual that sent large amounts of dark side energy throughout the galaxy. This ritual successfully managed to cloud the view of the Jedi and diminish their ability to use the Force. However, the Force itself retaliated, creating a being born purely out of it that one day was destined to finally destroy the Sith. That being's name was Anakin Skywalker. 
Number 6. In canon, Palpatine originally wanted Mother Talzin as his apprentice. Before he would take Mother Talzin's son Maul as his apprentice, he arrived on Dathomir to ask Talzin to join him. The two for a time actually got along quite well, as their ambitions were similar, but it became noticeably apparent Palpatine was far more powerful than the Night Sister. It was also clear the two wielded similar, but yet, different versions of the Force, as Talzin was more ritual-oriented and Palpatine commanded more raw power in the dark side. After seeing Maul, Palpatine requested he take the boys his apprentice instead of Talzin, but still offered her a role and power in his new empire. Partially out of lust for the power and fear of Palpatine, Talzin agreed. Number 5. Palpatine was compelled to murder his entire family before becoming a Sith Lord. As a younger man and student, Palpatine met Higo Damask, who was secretly the Sith Lord Darth Plagueis. Over several years, Palpatine and his father had argued and fought over the future of Naboo and politics, debating whether it should join the larger government of the Republic or remain more isolated. When Naboo was nearing a new election, Palpatine's father sent him away, and concerned, Palpatine reached out to Plagueis, as the two had become close friends. After discovering this, and Plagueis' own role in the election, Palpatine's father, along with his family, personally ventured to Palpatine, ordering him to remove himself and study even farther from home. As the two began to argue profusely, Palpatine's father confessed he wished Palpatine was dead and that he should have killed his son long ago. Finally embracing the darkness within him, Palpatine used the Force to massacre his entire family as a result. Following the murders, Palpatine again reached out to Plagueis, who revealed all to him and informed him about the Order of the Sith, an opportunity to achieve unlimited power. Number 4. He stopped caring about the Empire after becoming Emperor. After Palpatine took control of the galaxy and the Jedi seemingly died out, for the first few years Palpatine was a more present ruler, but as time progressed he began becoming bored with his position of power. At one point, Palpatine was wandering the halls of an Imperial stronghold, wondering what his master would have thought of ruling as he found it mundane. Palpatine would later confess he was a machine built and designed to conquer the galaxy, but never rule it. As more time passed, he became more and more reclusive, spending days practicing with his force abilities and next to no time governing the galaxy. Number 3. He wore Sith robes when declaring himself the new Emperor. Following his duel with Mace Windu, Palpatine explained his disfigured face as an assassination attempt and that because the Jedi proved themselves traitors, he deemed it necessary to become the new Emperor. Palpatine promised the galaxy peace, and the majority of the Senate loyally went along with their now former Chancellor. When delivering his speech to the Senate, Palpatine actually chose to wear a pair of his Sith robes as a final insult to the democracy he seemingly served, and the Jedi, as finally the Sith ruled the galaxy once more. Because the robes were so rare, Palpatine was confident no one would recognize them, and of course, he was correct, and no one did. Number 2. Darth Plagueis had no plans for an apprentice until meeting Palpatine. When Plagueis killed his own Sith Master, Darth Tenebris, he explained he believed he was the Sith that was going to rule the galaxy forever and fulfill what Lord Bane started thousands of years ago. In his Master's dying moments, Plagueis revealed his plans not to take an apprentice of his own, as he saw no need for it. However, after hearing of and finally meeting a young Palpatine, Plagueis could not resist training the boy, as his connection with the dark side and his natural thirst for blood and power fascinated the Sith Lord. Although not his original plan, Plagueis thought it a great tragedy to disobey what he saw the dark side willing him to follow. Little did he know he was not training a partner, but a successor. Number 1. Near the end of his final life and clone, Palpatine attempted to become a Skywalker. After his clones failed him, Palpatine tried to possess the baby Anakin Solo in a last effort to achieve immortality. After Palpatine's return from the grave, he managed to turn Luke Skywalker to the dark side for a time. Eventually, Luke retaliated though and destroyed the majority of Palpatine's clones. In a final attack against the Republic and New Jedi, Leia successfully fully brought her brother back to the light and Luke defeated Palpatine in one last lightsaber duel. After this final defeat, Palpatine attempted to possess the body of Leia's infant son, Anakin Solo, but with the combined strength of all the Skywalkers united in the light side, Palpatine met his final fate six years after his original body was destroyed on the second Death Star. This marked Palpatine's final defeat and complete destruction of his spirit. So those are 10 pretty crazy facts about the Sith Lord Darth Sidious. 